janefinch.com. Welcome to the Ward 7 and 8 debate for Toronto City Council representative. My name is Jacqueline Dixon and I will be your moderator tonight. I would first like to welcome all of those in attendance and inform you that we will be streaming this event throughout multiple media platforms, such as GBKM TV, YouTube channel, GBKM Facebook, as well as GBKM TuneIn app. Please feel free to share, tag, to like, share, and tag. The purpose of tonight's debate is to bring forward the suggestions, recommendations, questions and concerns for those, for, for those individuals and businesses within this historical Ward 7 and 8 district. Private sector business partners have come together to fund the cost of this debate. So please let me take a moment out to recognize them for their interests and contribution toward bringing this event to the community. The Grenada Rose Restaurant at 2721 Jane Street. The Epiphany Restaurant at 55 Beverly Hills Drive. Comda Advertising Connections at 15 Densley in North York. The Nikki Clark Show. New Era Communications and Meet the Motivators. Our community partners are the Nigerian Canadian Association, the Jamaican Canadian Association, and we give a special uh, recognition as acknowledgement as well to the Jane and Finch Task Force. And of course, your host tonight, GBKM FM Radio, the mouthpiece. This is the heartbeat of the Humber River Black Creek community. Before we get started with tonight's debate, we feel that it's necessary for us to recognize the great land and country that we live in. And before we get started with our frank but friendly discussions, let us take a moment out to appreciate this land of the, the home of the brave. Can we have uh, Stella please come and sing the national anthem for us? Please, for those of you that can stand, please do. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Canadian National Anthem. Oh, Canada. Our home and native land, true patriot's love, in all thy sons command. With glowing heart we see thee rise, the true not strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O oh we stand on God for Thank you, Stella. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's Toronto City Councilor debate will consist of three segments including opening remarks that will last approximately three minutes by each candidate. Each candidate would be called to the stage to give their opening remarks and then be seated before we get started. I'd like to call our first candidate to the stage right now. That would be Amanda Combs, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
first of all, I'd just like to thank um, everyone for putting this together and for having me. Um, one of the reasons why I decided to run is because I feel that there needs to be a voice for the community that is representative of the community. And also, um, as, a tenant council, as a tenant representative, I was elected four years ago. And through that position, I was given the opportunity to address many of the needs and concerns and issues that resided in my building. And also, not just my building, but many other buildings throughout the community. And the same things I keep hearing over and over again that I feel needs to be addressed. And people in the community feel like their voices are not being heard and properly represented by people who have been elected in the past. So I decided that I'm going to run because I feel, you know, there needs to be a voice here for the people. And also I do the mental health training for the community. And through that, I take maybe 10 to 20 calls a week from youth in our community who are having suicidal ideations, who are going through substance abuse problems. A lot of these issues are not addressed and it's important that they are and we need more mental health supports in our community. There's many things that are not being addressed, that are not being brought to the table, especially with all the new development that's happening as well. We want to make sure that it works for us, for our residents, and for the community. So with that being said, I'm just going to give it my best. I'm here to represent the voice of the people and to continue to do the hard work that I've been doing since I lived in this community. And best of luck to everybody. Thank you so much, Amanda. Next, I'm going to call Mr. Winston LaRose. Well, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, JVKMFM. This is a wonderful opportunity, a great night. I want to welcome everyone who is here. I'm glad to be able to be speaking to my community about my candidacy. I want to thank the younger generations that are running for office. I think this is so necessary. I have been there for them, and I'm happy to see Amanda running. I'm happy to see Tiffany running. I'm happy to see all these young people fighting for a community that I came here 25 years ago to fight and die for. It's called the Jane Finch, and that name resonates with me. It's the reason why I came here. It's the reason why I'm going to win this election and why I'm going to stay here. I got a message, right? I got a message 25 for 1994 where Linda Moraway put out a call asking for anyone who would like to support her to take five kids from here and five from Jamaica to Ghana in 1997. And I came down, I worked with her, I took up that call we raised $40,000, we took those kids, they're doctors and lawyers and so on and so forth, right from this community. I built this community over the years that I've been here. I come in seven days a week almost, I don't get paid, I travel from Burlington, though I have a residence here for those who think I don't live here as well. But I come in from Burlington, I spend 12 hours a day, six hours a day, I don't get paid, I'm at the York Gate Mall for the last 12 years, but probably not 12, I came there in 2000, so that's 19 years first community organization to come there. I represent the Jane Finch Concerns in this organization. I'm in the prisons. I'm dealing with Toronto community housing. Everything that you talk about, I have done. I'm fed up because nothing further is being done. So let's get the vote in the right place. I'll represent you properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaRose. Thank you. Next, we're asking for Deanna Scro. I thought we were going alphabetical and I'd have a few minutes. Anyway, good evening everyone and thank you to everyone in the community who's taking time to be here with us this evening. One of the biggest concerns I have in our democracy today is the apathy that we see. Voter turnout is lower than it's ever been and we may see that in this municipal election. I hope we won't. I think it's imperative and important that we have the best, most effective representation at every level of government that includes our very important city hall in our city of Toronto. And more, now more than ever, when we have a riding 
that has gone from 47 to 25, is it imperative that we have an effective voice? Each and every one of you will have a chance to have a new councillor, because this is a new ward. So regardless of who is elected, they will become the new councillor for Humber River Black Creek. I want to be that choice for you, and I believe I deserve that choice. And I deserve that because we deserve change. We deserve a councillor who will advocate for each and every one of us. For far too long, I have seen our community deteriorate. It's unfortunate, it's wrong, and it happens because people don't understand. When you have a job to do, you need to show up to work and do it. I have that, I know how to do that, and I will do that for each and every one of you if you give me a chance on October 22nd. So I hope you'll vote Scro, and thank you so much for coordinating the debate. Thank you so much to my fellow candidates, including Tiffany Ford, who's not with us this evening, and I look forward to engaging in positive conversation with each and every one of you. Let's welcome our next candidate, sitting councillor, Mr. Anthony Peruzza. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you to the organizers of the debate. I want to acknowledge all my fellow candidates as well. It's tough to stand for elections, and it's tough to put yourself in front of people. Um, elections invariably are about choice. And people want uh, to make uh, the right choice. Let me tell you a little bit about me. I grew up not too far from here. We first settled, I lived on Western Road, just south of Finch. We came over to this country and I was, I was uh, almost nine years old. My folks settled in the basement of my uncle's house on a street called St. Lucy. And, uh, and that's where, you know, it began for me, my Canadian experience. I went to local schools. I went to St. Jude's, I went to St. Basil's, I graduated from York University. My parents, my father worked as a carpenter. My, my mother, she was, worked in a factory nearby on Rivaldo Road. Uh, she worked shift work. She would work the evening shift um, so that my father would take care of us, my sister and I, during the day, and then my mother would do that work at nighttime. The experience I got from that is that they worked hard. They worked hard to make ends meet. I understand that. I understand what it takes to work hard because I got it from them. If I'm elected, I'm going to work very, very hard for each and one, every one of you. I don't, I'm not one of those guys who goes seeking the limelight. I don't need to be famous. I don't need to chase headlines. For me, it's about rolling up your sleeves and getting the work done and getting results. So if you elect Anthony Peruzza, that's exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get a hard worker who seeks results. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peruzza. And our last candidate this evening will be sitting councillor, Mr. Giorgio Mamaliti. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you to the organizers, uh, to those that are running in the election. Thank you very much. We've got three weeks to go, roughly, uh, and I'm hoping that you will choose me yet again to represent Ward 7. The reason uh, I want to represent Ward 7 is because it's my home. It has been my whole life. I was born and bred in the Jane and Finch Corridor. I went to uh, and attended Stanley Road Public School uh, as, as a child. St. Jane Francis, uh, elementary school, Oakdale uh, Junior High at the time, and Westview Centennial. Graduated in Humber College. I, I love the Jane and Finch Corridor, always have. I love our community. I've enjoyed representing our community for 28 years. 
And I have rolled up my sleeve as well. I have taken an at-risk community, of which I represent now, and now it's become a very th it's a thriving community economically. We've been able to turn that around with, with development of the private sector coming in. We have rezoned much of the ward, and now you're starting to see the changes in the, in the Finch and Western Road area, Shepherd and Western Road area, and the old workers' compensation line. We've increased the level of income substantially in the area, and now it's a destination place. I know that many of you might think, you know, perhaps, what is a Starbucks? Starbucks, for me, is coming uh, shortly uh, to the Shepherd and Western Road area. And Starbucks just doesn't move into any community. Starbucks moves into communities that are thriving already or upcoming and thriving. I am proud of what we've done. I am proud of the fact that our crime rate has gone down uh, substantially, and I'm proud of bringing my particular experience to the Jane and Finch corridor, of which we're going to talk about tonight. It is about, it is about economic change in the, in, the, in the Jane and Finch corridor, and I've got a lot of ideas. I've shared them with you already, and stop the segregation in the Jane and Finch community. That's going to be my prime focus. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our candidates. And let it be known that we did also reach out to Ms. Tiffany Ford, who declined the invitation to speak at tonight's debate. The questions in segment one are directed by moderator. Each candidate will have approximately two minutes to answer the question. If any follow-up is required, you'll have 30 seconds to respond. The first question this evening is, with recent changes made to the Toronto City Council wards, that means that our city councillors will now have a workload twice the size of that in the past. It's already been known that city councillors, once election periods are done, are very scarce and hard to find. Now that your wards will double to in excess of 100,000 constituents, what is your contingency plan on how to stay and remain a frontline worker. We'll start with Ms. Scrow. Can we stand? You, if you choose. Okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I'm going to take... take it okay. I'm going to take a point from the question that you just uh, brought, because I think it's a very important question and a very important point. You said that, unfortunately, occasionally, uh, politicians get elected and become scarce. For any of you in this audience who know my mother, Judy Scro, I am very proud to share with each and every one of you, even though 30 weeks of the year she's in Ottawa and many other days she's traveling through Canada, it would be very difficult for any of you to say she's scarce. Why? Because public service is a job that takes seven days a week. It's a job that requires hard work and it requires effort. And with all due respect to my current colleagues who sit at City Hall, it, is imp it is shocks me that I attend events like the JCA run, for example, and my colleagues are not there, that I attend bingo halls and I attend functions in our community, and I don't see these representatives. So that shocks me because they're the Toronto local representative. So when the ward is twice the size, it's gonna take twice the effort. And what you're going to need in order to achieve good representation for every segment of our community, and our community doesn't include just Jane Finch. Our community includes York University, Humber Lee Summit, Humber Summit, Emory Village. It's going to take a hard working representative. I'm suggesting to you that as a lawyer, as an accomplished lawyer who's raised two children, 25 and 22, and became vice president and general counsel of a company, that I know what it means to work hard. I'm not doing this Thank for a you. job or a career. I'm doing this for each and every one Thank of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scrub. Mr. Mamalidi, same question to you, please. Well, I've been a sitting councillor for a long time. I'm not looking at switching up my position regularly and running in every election that, that's, that comes my way uh, over a, a, a year or two. I am, I am one that believes in hard work. I've shown my hard work. I've revitalized the whole community over the last 18 years. I, I plan well and I plan communities well. I'm going to bring that into the Jane and Finch uh, corridor because I think we now can with one voice and not two. 
I'll tell you where we have suffered with respect to two voices, and that's the LRT versus the subway. We have had a broken communication between two councillors. In one particular area, and, and now I'm finding out in another area, we want the subway. And I'm going to make sure that that one voice that I bring to you will be, will be for the subway and not the train in the middle of the road of which others are pushing in this particular community. It's going to be a disaster with traffic if that happens. Police, we need more police officers on the streets and I'm going to ensure that that happens. 31 Division needs help. Thank you. And with respect Two to minutes. social housing, we Thank have you. got a huge issue with that. And I plan on dealing Thank with you. that head on. And the only people that need Mr. to be afraid of, of that are the drug dealers and those that choose Mr. to LaRose. use the guns and kill people. Thank you, Mr. I'm, I'm going to deal with them. Thank you. Same question to you, Mr. LaRose. You have two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to ask that you be respectful. You will have an opportunity to direct your questions to the candidates yourselves. So while I have the moderator session, I will ask for your respect. I thank you. I thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, if, if you, I don't know when my time starts. but if It you starts permit, right now, sir. Go but ahead. If you permit me, <laughs> I will respond. Now, the question about reduction in the size of council is a fundamentally important one. Already, we don't have adequate representation and to reduce it to the point that it's been brought is a great travesty for people in the Jane Finch and the southern part of the Jane Finch area, what used to be York 7 riding, uh, or Ward 7 riding. I'm very concerned about this reduction and the reduction in the need to save money. You must remember, it was not so many years ago when we had five mayors, five city councils, all with representatives representing each regional district. And our population size was much smaller than it is now. They collapsed that into 55 seats. And what have you got? Less representation, no contact with your councillors. Now they've reduced it to a further 25 seats. You will have little or no representation. So you need a representative that will be interested in your interests, in your resources that are limited and the opportunities that you don't get. And I want to be there to tell you that that possibility is still there, given the disadvantages that have been imposed with the opportunity that the incumbent councillors have had to campaign and to run before the rest of us knew what was happening. But I can tell you that we will make sure that change comes and change that is beneficial to the people of Jane Finch, and I will represent that change. Thank for you, you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Combs, you have two minutes. Thank you. So that's a great question. Um, obviously with the wards, the amount of counselors reduced, it's going to mean double the amount of work. It's already hard for the counselors that we have to reach everybody or to answer all their phone calls and, to all their qu and answer all their questions. I already have a group of students who are willing to volunteer for their hours that we're going to form subcommittees to go out if I'm elected to represent different parts of our neighborhood, our current Ward 7, that will address and be there to um, take care of the needs and concerns of all the residents. And I feel like that's like the most practical solution to reach everybody and to get it done in a way and in a timely manner. But definitely, it's going to be double the workload, and we're going to need more staff and more people to make sure everyone's voices are heard. And as a single mother, a student, and somebody that works constantly and represents the needs of my community on a daily basis, answering phone calls, knocking doors, that's what I do every single day. I've done that before I was elected as a tenant representative, and I'll continue to do that if I'm elected as a counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Mr. Anthony Peruzza, you have two minutes.
So we need you. We need to reach out to you. To you. We need to involve you in the decisions and in the work that we do, neighborhood by neighborhood. Because no one understands the neighborhoods better than you. Nobody understands your situation better than you. As an example, and, and I, and I want to commend Amanda who's standing here for election. Amanda, Amanda cares about her building. She cared about her building so much she wanted to set up a gymnasium downstairs. She reached out to us, to me and to my office, and we helped her set up that gymnasium in her own building so that the tenants could get active and stay active. That is the way we, get you have, we have to do it. The geography is big. Your representative isn't going to be everywhere, so the reliance, and we, we need to bring you into that process. We need to bring you into that process very actively and very decisively. For example, I want to commend Winston LaRose. When Winston LaRose wanted to do his caravana parade, he reached out, he said, look, Anthony, I, I need your help. We need to get this done. And I said, Winston, we can agree more. You do the work, and I'm going to support you. I'm going to help you. I, I did what I could in helping him organize those events, and that's how we got those events off the ground. And that's what we need to continue to do, neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street, community by community. Thank you, Mr. Peritza. <laughs> Staying on the same category of the reduction in city councilor seats, um, we do have another question that was posed as a result of polling individuals that uh, listen to our station and uh, commute uh, within the Black Creek, Humber River Black Creek uh, community. The question uh, to you now is, would you, considering that the size has doubled in, of constituents, in order to be held accountable for the four-year term that you're going to be given, would you consider hosting town hall meetings on a monthly basis during your four-year tenure in order for your constituents to hold you accountable for what you promised prior to election? We'll start with Judy. Deanna. Deanna. Uh, I think that's a terrific idea, and I think we should rotate the town halls throughout the community. Uh, I think it's imperative, as, as Councillor Prusa has shared with you, uh, it is imperative that the councillor representing the community engages the community. Neighborhood groups, I will continue to encourage and support neighborhood groups, and I would absolutely commit to at least monthly meetings rotating throughout the community, communicated very clearly on the radio station and as much as we can through social media, and try and develop those networks. Uh, one of the drawbacks of our area is we don't get enough community involvement and community support. And to be an effective representative, you need to hear from the community. You need to be our eyes and our ears so that we can then take the issues and concerns to City Hall and advocate for each and every one of you. So I absolutely would commit to that uh, and you. support it. Thank you. Mr. Mamaliti, would you commit to monthly town hall meetings that would hold you accountable for the things that you promised during the election? I'm already doing it. Uh, I have monthly meetings on a regular basis, sometimes even weekly meetings on issues, depending on what those issues might be. And in fact, and in fact I think it's necessary Silence, to please. be able to, to reach out to, to pockets and, and talk to them about issues like uh, transportation. I found out in this election that there hadn't been, in, in the Ward 8 part of this equation anyway, there hadn't been one public meeting to talk about uh, whether or not you want an LRT, a train on top of the road, or whether you want a subway. In fact, it was pushed on you, and the parking thank lot... Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mamaliti. We do have a segment for transportation that will be a question. Well, that's, that, it's, that will, it's, that it's an important up. part of, of, of consultation, Certainly. right? You've got to talk to your community about things like this. You can't ram it down people's throats. Many people didn't even know that there were going to be trains parked right, right across the street from our mall at York Gate Mall. If Thank there you. were We're going to give you an opportunity to discuss that very shortly. That. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. LaRose, uh, this is a follow-up question, so technically it should only be 30 seconds. Uh, so if you can tell us whether or not you would commit to your monthly town hall meetings holding uh, you accountable. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. I don't think I'll get 30 seconds on this one because I'll be always over almost before I got started. But however, having said that, I want to tell you that outside of town hall meetings, 
We need to have a systemic infrastructural seconds, process that allows better communications and compensation for the planning and for the representation that needs to come in designing and maintaining your, your Jane Finch area and the other riding neighborhoods that exist within that larger context. I will be ensuring that I bring into play those systemic features that will regularly meet. And they have to give us the budget for that. I must tell you that. Because you can't do this without thank money. You, so thank you, thank you, Mr. LaRose. Thank you for money your commitment wouldn't help. in holding thank town you hall much. meetings monthly. Amanda Combs. So I will commit to holding monthly town hall meetings. I already do hold monthly and weekly meetings for my residents and other people who do not reside in my um, building, primary building. And part of this is to make sure that everyone's voices are heard and that issues are addressed and so that things that have happened in the community are not forced onto um, residents. So this is something I already do and it's something that I will continue to do. I will continue to make sure that the residents and the members of our community voices are heard and that they're represented by somebody who actually believes in what they, um, their rights. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Mr. Peruzza, would you commit to your monthly town hall meetings, yes, holding sir. you accountable for the promises that you make on this campaign trail. Yes, absolutely. Uh, community engagement, community involvement, sharing of information is fundamental to my role as a city councilor. Uh, so that, so uh, that, would be, uh, that would be a given. It is something that I have done on a regular basis, and it's something that I would continue to do uh, on, all, on all issues, including transit. Thank you. Thank you. The next we'll move uh, next uh, topic we will move to is housing. Again, question is for all of the candidates. You will have two minutes, only 30 seconds on a, res on a uh, response to a follow-up question. With some residents getting priced out of the rental market, what are your proposals, if any, to help alleviate this problem? Deanna. Affordability of housing in Toronto and throughout the GTA is a very serious concern. I unfortunately know far too many people and have met far too many people who are struggling, uh, who either cannot find a place to live uh, or are going to have to move. This includes our very large seniors population as well as our new immigrant base. The solution for affordable housing is not easy. It's going to involve uh, action very quick action. For example, we look at our fir grove pocket. We have a condemned section of fir grove. It has been condemned for far too long. It remains standing, which poses a number of issues. But it needs, we need to have a plan. A plan should have been designed and implemented and commenced already. Situations like that are not acceptable. How we're going to deal with affordable housing is going to take all three levels of government. It's going to take contribution from the federal government, the provincial government, and from the City of Toronto. And I think we have to be very, very concerned at the city level in terms of can we, where is the space for the housing, can we uh, accommodate the needs, and how do we best do that? And I suggest to you that I am a representative that can work effectively with all three levels of government and with council, a council of 25, to ensure that we have proper development and housing in our community. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mamalidi. We're going to start from this so I, I wrote the affordable housing policy for the City of Toronto and I plan on tapping into that particular policy that I wrote like I did at Regent Park and Lawrence Heights and like I've done at Firgrove. Uh, that's, how, that's why it's stagnant. Those particular units that are stagnant were full of mold and it's, it's inexcusable for government to be treating their tenants the way we have. And it's my time to start speaking out with respect to Jane and Finch. It's our turn to take advantage of that. We are going to provide for better housing when we decide that we're on the list and we will take down our social housing net in the Jane and Finch corridor and replace it with a mix so that everybody's living together and not 
and not segregated the way we've been for the last 50 years on welfare. You cannot live a comfortable life on welfare. I don't care what anybody says. It's time that we deal with that particular issue, bring the private sector in here to make sure that we get some proper housing built out because the government will not give us the money to do it. And then the jobs come Thank after you. that. And when those children get the jobs, they feel good about themselves. And that's how you create Thank you, a sir. very positive community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. LaRose, you have two minutes. Thank Silence, please. Silence. Mr. LaRose, you have two minutes. Uh, please let me have my two minutes. <laughs> I, I need to have all, if I have to follow this every time, I don't want to lose my minutes. We have a speaker. We so, have a speaker. Uh, uh, unless we can have control here, I don't get my time to speak. I'm going to need silence from the audience. You're taking away, I just want to, I just want to mention to the audience that the time that you take away from the monitor, the, the moderator is actually your time that you're taking away from yourselves to ask the questions directly to the candidates when the moderator session is completed. So, Toronto Community patient. Housing, the whole management structure needs to be redone. They've been bringing nothing but... Sir, the question, but just to make sure they, you understand the question... They've been doing question, nothing but grief sir, to the, the area. Question, the question is that residents are being priced out of, rental, of the rental market. What are your proposals, if any, to alleviate those problems? It is not a... Uh, uh, that, that's, that's the issue I'm dealing with. I'm addressing okay. that question very directly. I'm telling you there's a systemic problem with that, uh, that institution. Okay. And that institution needs to be reorganized. They've reduced tenant management or tenant representation management. They've removed managers. They've tried to save us costs. But what we have are uh, housing that people are kicked out of for all kinds of reasons. I plan to do, uh, what the first thing I will do is address a restructuring of that system. And I had one person come to me just yesterday because they, a 65 year old kicked out of his, uh, evicted, they changed the locks on him. He had to sleep in the stairwell. And my intervention today allowed him to get back into that building because I went right to the top. This kind of thing just must not happen. But it's been going on for too long and we need to revisit that outside of the rebuilding. Gentrification is here, folks. There's no question about that. How we manage that gentrification is what's going to be important. And I suggest to you that we need the community like yourselves to be putting pressure on Toronto Community Housing and its management structure to ensure that the residents are able to afford the enjoyment of their lives in those buildings without being treated as badly as they have been. Thank you, thank you. Amanda, do you have a, uh, Amanda Combs, do you have a plan or a proposal on how to alleviate the uh, strain that has been put on the rental market? Okay, so as a tenant of Toronto Community Housing, I too am faced with this problem where if I work a job, my rent increases, or if I go to school and I'm working, my rent increases. And just like myself, there's many residents who have to make the decision between buying groceries or paying your rent, working or not working. And I think what we need to explore is the way RGI, rent gear to income, how those calculations are made. Part of the reasons why people can't afford to pay their rent is because um, the way that it's calculated. I think um, that the rent should be geared towards people's income. It should be reflective of their income and people shouldn't be having to pay rent. That's way more than what their initial income is. I think we need to find a way to reduce that to even 10% of what people bring home from their work and on their paychecks. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Peruzza. We need to continue to press our provincial and federal governments to come to the table and create affordable housing. The, affordable, the, the development of affordable housing has dried up for a period of 20, 25 years. We're not producing nearly enough units to be able to meet Torontonians' demands around affordability. We need to continue to press the provincial government to come back to the table and create real rent control yes. before rents uh, are, are simply unaffordable for everyone. We also need, I think as a city, 
and I, and I started this, and I continue to press for it, and we need to develop it. So while, while people are asked for very, very high rents for their housing, they're given very, very poor accommodations because the vacancy rate is next to zero. So landlords don't pay attention to the housing. It's no longer decent for people, even though you pay exorbitant rents. So I fought for and pushed for landlord licensing to, so that the city has the tools to be able to press landlords to fix the housing, to provide decent housing for people. Decent housing for very, Silence. very high rents. Thank you, Mr. Peruzza. This question is going to go to Mr. Peruzza, the next question on, in the housing segment. Uh, Mr. Peruzza, do you support the recent suggestions by our mayor and others on this panel to disqualify individuals convicted of serious crimes into re-entering TCHC developments again? I think that I think that reintroducing someone into a community where they've been uh, getting into trouble, reintroducing them into the same environment, reintroducing them to the same people, to the same conditions, I don't think that that's healthy for the individual. And it's certainly not healthy for the, for the community, for the local community or the surrounding community. So I think we need to find a better way to do that. So the, the mayor's proposal uh, to, uh, to, to say that if you're convicted of a crime, you can't come back into the, into the same community, I think that that has merits. And we need to take a look at that seriously uh, for everyone concerned, including the individual who's been convicted of a crime. Thank you. Amanda. Do you support the suggestion as put forward by the mayor in regards to serious crime? I think one thing that we should consider is why these individuals are committing these serious crimes. We need to find out what, like, what's going on, why are they broken, and we need to fix that cycle. I don't think kicking them out of their house is the solution. I do feel that we can have ways where we can reintegrate them back into their houses, maybe offer some kind of probationary program where they go to school or they volunteer or they mentor other youth in the community who may be causing problems. And then with that being done in a way that everyone feels is um, proper for them, then we can bring them back, but I don't think having them removed from their families and their homes is the solution. We need to find out why they're doing this so that we can stop it from happening in the future. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Mr. LaRose. Well, you know, I can't disagree more with the mayor. I think this is an outrageous suggestion. Uh, we've had this for years. Our politicians are not dealing with the fundamental root causes of what's causing crime. It's always about bringing in more police officers, putting police officers in our schools. They'll bring them in our churches next. What I'm saying to you is this. If we restructure our approach, our governmental approach, to how we create societies and communities, we will not have the crime problem. If you look at the rate of crime being committed, currently I sit on the road, uh, on the REAC board, which is a corrections, uh, it's an ethnocultural committee, uh, advising the Minister of Corrections, Canada. And I go to, into the prisons and I see our fellows up there, bright young minds, no jobs to do, no training, no capacity building within the communities. They're being segregated from their families. We cannot accept that. The mayor should be putting some money, not into programs, but into work projects and training projects that will allow people to have better lives and produce for themselves Thank within you. their community. Thank I'm you, going Mr. to make LaRose. sure that that happens effectively from the time I become the next council in this life. Thank you, Mr. LaRose. <laughs> Mr. Mamaliti, same question to you, sir. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really Silence. glad you asked. I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, this is a huge problem that we, we've experienced and are experiencing. I, I, I worked in Ontario housing before politics. 
uh, I've seen a, a huge difference between uh, that level of housing that we offered back then and now. Social housing has become the incubator to our social problems in this community, whether people want to believe it or not. They are harboring some of the worst criminals in this country. And, the te and, the, and, there, and some, of these, some of these criminals, some of these criminals are actually running their particular portfolio in the TCHC units, not TCHC themselves. It is time for us to do something drastic, and that is to, to evict and get rid of the people that do are causing the particular problem. But I also think that it's also time for us to be real about what's going on in this community. Six generations almost of welfare in this community, six generations of social housing. The experiment has gone wrong and those children who have been segregated have grown up so angry that they are now holding a gun and shooting each other and now bringing it outside of the social housing complex and putting Thank everybody you. else in danger. Thank you. Thank you. Deanna. Thank you. So Thank you. You know, I, I certainly don't think this is a question that can be answered in two minutes. Many opinions have been shared by the group here this evening that have some merit. So we have to recognize the merit in the mayor's suggestion. If someone has been convicted of a very, very serious crime, do we want to put them back into the environment where perhaps they are leading others to follow that path into violence, into gangs, and into danger? Having said that, if you don't give someone a chance to reintegrate into their community and with their family, then what is the option or opportunity to rehabilitate? So we have to balance both. I think each case has to be looked at individually and assessed individually. And to suggest that we're going to knock down all of the social housing and we're going to solve this problem in that manner is also not fair. It's, it is a simple simple solution to what is a true problem. I think what we've heard from this panel are uh, many suggestions we have to take into account. One starts with our youth, starting with programs, supporting our youth, our racialized youth in particular. This community has great successful programs. The Spot, Yace, Belka summer camps. We need to take those models, support them. We need better community centers and parks for our children. We need support system for our single mothers and single parents. And we need to give children an option. Mr. LaRose referred to a trip to Ghana with kids, and these kids became lawyers and doctors. We need to help give children a path. When the children of Firgrove can't afford to visit the capital of this country, that's wrong. And that's where we as a community need to come together to ensure that the opportunities the children of Jane Finch community have are the same opportunities as our children in Humber Summit or Humber Leah. Thank Let's you. Let's give them all Thank a path. You. Mr. Peruzza. Last question in the housing segment. Mr. Peruzza, some of our residents have already been forced out of the housing, mar the rental housing market and even into hotels. Hotels that have now been taken over by refugees and asylum seekers. Do you endorse the arrival of additional refugees and asylum seekers into our community to further strain the resources we already have? I think that the city of Toronto, I, I think that the city of Toronto um, doesn't have a say in, in whether or not uh, we accept or not accept uh, individuals coming to the city. What we as the city have to do is we have to figure out how we accommodate the people coming into the city uh, as a city. And, uh, and I agree that with the position that was recently taken by city council. If the federal government is, uh, is permitting uh, many more newcomers uh, uh, to both Canada and Toronto, and I don't, I don't disagree with the, with the government, then, but they also need to give us the resources to be able to deal with all the newcomers. They need to give us the resources to make sure that people here aren't displaced and, that, uh, and to make sure that the people that are arriving have the resources and the places where they can settle into and be, uh, and be integrated into, into the city and move on with their lives and, and become uh, you know, uh, successful like many of us have done. Many of us have come from somewhere else. 
Uh, very few of us uh, in the room were, were probably born here. Uh, so, um, so we need to make sure that we do get those resources uh, from our federal government when those people uh, arrive. Thank you. Amanda. Um, I think that um, before we even take refugees into the country and immigrants... Silence. That, okay. I think that before we even take um, refugees into the country, that we have to go back to the drawing board and look at the ratios. Before we do that, we have to make sure that we have adequate housing that matches the amount of people that are coming in and adequate resources as well so that there is not a strain on the system and that everybody does have um, equal opportunities. Those that do reside here, those who are Canadian citizens, permanent residents, refugees, immigrants, and everybody just has the same amount of um, opportunity to be successful um, in Toronto. So definitely I think that we just have to go back to the drawing board before we um, bring people into the country and make sure that those ratios are equal. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. LaRose. It's one of those very difficult questions. Um, I have to deal with a lot of refugees who come to me, but I also have to deal with a lot of local people that come to me looking for housing that they can't find. They're going into shelters that have no room left. Certainly a burden has been placed upon this great city of Toronto. We have to, and in the Jane Finch, we're feeling that crisis because many of the people living within the Jane Finch area that cannot find emergency housing when they're being kicked out of TCHC or other places, those people come to me and we're looking everywhere, every day in my work, to try and place them somewhere. I want to say to our community that we have to be respectful to the refugees themselves who come in because they're coming from a different kind of circumstance that's very difficult to deal with. And many of us only just manage barely to escape being refugees ourselves before getting here. This is a great place of refuge. We need to keep that tradition alive and well, but the federal government obviously has to come to the table and provide resources to ensure that Toronto doesn't carry as big a burden as it's been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaRose. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to you that, that uh, we've already got, uh, or already maxed out on, on Wilson Avenue, the hotel uh, that's on Wilson uh, is already maxed out. The refugees are already there. We're paying to the ex excess $300 a day. Silence, please. This is a very serious issue, and, and our community is suffering because we don't have the space for them. We've got, we're, we're paying $300 a day per refugee uh, on Wilson Avenue uh, to stay. They're getting all the benefits. And one of the things that I'm learning uh, really fast, and I, I must say to you that I think we should put the program on hold uh, because yes. for a lot of reasons, uh, and I'm about to talk about a couple of them. Um, one, uh, we can't afford it. We don't have the money, and there's only one taxpayer. What I'm learning at the door is that that particular taxpayer is saying enough, especially if they're seniors and are diabetic, diabetic and have to pay for their needles, have to pay for medicines, can't afford it because of their particular pensions uh, without increase. They are really upset at the fact that the federal government now is choosing to bring in so many people without us being able to take care of them. And now, knowing that they're getting everything paid for, everything paid for, it is causing a divide in this country. It's causing a divide in this particular city and in our community because our seniors and those that can't afford things are starting to say, what about me? I've been here a long time. I've worked. I've contributed. And why is it that I can't get my medicines paid for, but people that come into the country are totally getting everything for free? Thank you. I've had the unfortunate uh, opportunity to visit the Toronto Hotel several times over the last few years, which houses a number of refugees. And it brings to light the challenges that many of these people have experienced. And while many of us have come from other countries, a number of us did not come here persecuted and as refugees. So I certainly feel for the families. But at the end of the day, our city is feeling the highest burden of the refugees that are coming into Canada and that is not 
fair. So while I respect the beautiful country that we live in and are part of where we support others, others who are persecuted and we give them a lending helping hand, many of these people that I've met are looking for work, they are trying to get on their feet and I respect that, but there are too many concentrated in the city of Toronto. So I support council, I support the mayor, and I can tell you unequivocally that we need to see the federal government step up and contribute more funds towards helping the City of Toronto. We need to locate these people in other jurisdictions where there are jobs, where there are opportunities, so that all the pressure is not on our city. It is impacting people who need affordable housing as well because it's eating up the limited supply that we have. So this is a serious issue and it doesn't involve being divisive. It involves remaining true to our Canadian spirit, which is being open and caring, but recognize that there are financial components to supporting refugees and asylum seekers, and those components need to be borne by the entire country and not just the residents of Toronto. Thank so you. I would advocate for more support from different levels of government. Thank you. <clears throat> that concludes our housing segment. We now move into the private sector segment. The Black Creek Humber River uh, District has not seen a serious injection of private sector investment in years. We haven't attracted any major uh, players into this area uh, for a number of reasons. In order to be able to ri raise the income level, in order to decrease the child poverty level, we have to bring some opportunities for prosperity to the residents. And that lies with a, a major investments from private sector. In which ways do you have planned to attract private sector to the Black Creek Humber River uh, District in order to deal with these issues uh, of poverty and, and uh, unemployment? Mr. Peruzza. So what we have been doing is to do that is creating the environment, the infrastructure that industry and people need uh, to get to work and to get goods and services out of the community. We just recently built a subway through the neighborhood. We're going to build another major significant project on Finch Avenue, a transit project on Finch Avenue, which better connects us uh, as well. We have clusters that are developing in the, what we now call the Duke Heights BIA area in my ward, the existing ward, uh, between Keel and Dufferin, Shepherd and Steeles. We have a very, very significant pharmaceutical cluster. We have a very, very significant furniture cluster. So when I, what I say to people is, we need to, to create that infrastructure that businesses look to, for example, we got a new plant just up on Keel Street because of that infrastructure called Apollo. Created a, a, a number of uh, very significant jobs. So what I say to people is when you look at the future of our area, and this is, this is the vision that I think we need, to, we need to promote and we need to communicate to folks. We are bounded by significant highways, 407 to the north, 401 to the south, 400, we have a significant rail line, we now have a subway, we're going to have an LRT line that can, that's going to connect our area and eventually to the biggest employment district in the GTA, and that's the, the airport area. We need to create, to do that, so that the players that we talk about, those high-tech uh, players globally that are looking to locate uh, uh, into places, will look at us and say, wow, look at that. Look at the infrastructure that these folks have. Rail lines, highways. These are the arteries that bring workers to the place and bring goods and services out of the area. And I believe that we are the future center of the GTA if we keep doing that work. Thank you, Mr. Pritza. Amanda, same question. 
With all those infrastructures being put in place, I believe that no matter what kind of development is brought here, that many people are not going to consider this a desirable neighborhood or ward to bring their business to until we solve the root problems, which is getting rid of the stigmatization that's um, associated with our ward and with Jane and Finch primarily. And I think that once those problems are dealt with, the root causes, then we can talk about different types of infrastructure and we can talk about um, different type of businesses. But I believe that until we make this a desirable neighborhood where people who already live here want to stay in and live in, and we make this a neighborhood where people can thrive in both businesses that already are here and those that are planned to come into the community, it's a waste of time, I think. Sorry. Wow. Mr. LaRose. Well, I think it's good news time, quite frankly. Well, the moment we brought the infrastructure into this area, we've got subways taking the downtown into the new uptown in Vaughan. That's a reality. We've got Woodbine and the OLG, which will be a major, substantial development in the area. This is investment. Jane Finch is not just the intersection of those streets. It extends and expands into all of those areas. We are going to be seeing development in this Jane Finch area that would boggle your mind just within the next five years. It's happening. What we need to do is control how that investment is managed to ensure that our local populations get those jobs. We're not getting the jobs. I, 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 sh I watched the stadium being built at York University, a $50 million stadium. I watched those three subway stations, Black Creek Pioneer Village, York University and Finch West, we were not on those jobs. We, we, we've got to ensure that this direction that has been happening in the past does not continue. And the only way to do that is to bring some foresight, some visionary things like my Jane Finch Economic Community Development Initiative. Bring that into play where we build capacity within the young, the unemployed, and all the people who want to work and can't get work. Train them with the skills and development, put them to work. Thank you. Bringing in the, envi the, uh, the private sector is, uh, isn't easy. You need a plan. You need to make sure they're comfortable in bringing their money into your community. I've done that in, in Ward 7. In fact, there's cranes everywhere in, in Ward 7, the current Ward 7. Everything is being knocked down and rebuilt. That didn't come by accident. I did that. 18 years ago. It was my vision that brought that forward. I'm the one who brought it forward when people said that we wouldn't be able to do it. So I plan on, on bringing more to this particular community with a plan and with a vision. And for those of you that think that the private sector is going to come to the table, if we continue, continue segregating almost 60% of the Jane and Finch corridor, uh, you're wrong. If you think that, that by continuing the welfare stream the way we are at Jane and Finch, um, again, almost six generations of it, you're wrong. We need, we need to figure out how to bring the private sector with what we've got. I plan on looking at every piece of land that the city owns, including the social housing net that we have. I'd like to do what we did at Regent Park, bring the private sector in, rebuild, and then you get some confidence in the private sector. Poverty breeds poverty. And for those of you that are proud of that, I will say to you, you will not attract a dime if you continue on this on, on status quo in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I can tell you that I don't easily agree with our councillors and some of our col my colleagues here today in terms of the fact that the community doesn't have the infrastructure and the investment and the interest simply because of the people in the community. Toronto is a great city. Our communities of Humber Summit, Humber Lee and Jane Finch are great pockets with pools of ample employees, qualified employees. We have York University. There is no good justifiable reason 
for our community not to be working with the banks to have some of their call centers located in our pockets. There's no good reason why when I drive around certain pockets, all I see are auto shops and mechanic shops and cars parked on cars. It's unattractive, it's unappealing, and that planning is the problem. And that planning stems from ineffective representation at City Hall for our community for far too many years. Our voices needed to be heard 15, 20 years ago. I'm thrilled that the subway is there, but that took far too long. Transit, we talk about an LRT, we talk about another subway. All of these solutions take too long. We need immediate transit solutions for our constituents. I hear it every day. I hear it over in Torbury, a brand new pocket. They don't have a bus service on the weekend. How are they going to get around? That is unacceptable, and that again happens because of far too long of ineffective representation. I plan to change that when I'm elected your councillor on October 22nd. Thank you. Thank you. We've built up quite a bit of online interest. We have quite a bit of questions online. We're, we want to take it to the audience. Now the moderator questions might have to be suppressed to a certain degree because we have built up quite a bit of interest online as well to give you an opportunity to answer these questions. I'm going to quickly move over now to uh, two other segments for the moderator. And uh, the one is policing. Uh, crime has uh, decreased in the Humber River Black Creek area uh, recently. Um, and although it is stigmatized as being a area that can, has, carries a lot of gun violence, the reality is 31 Division has released reports that indicate that our gun violence has been reduced of, of recent. Um, policing, uh, because it has been reduced, uh, it does still need to be further reduced. We'd like to know what is your plan to further reduce the amount of crime within the Humber River Black Creek area? Deanna. I was so pleased to hear from Inspector Greenaway in 31 Division that in fact we've seen some short-term relief. Uh, I think one of the, um, the crime throughout the city is inevitable. We live in a big city. We need to be realistic. We need to all work together to stem the violence. We need to, I believe in legislation banning handguns. I don't think there's any need for them whatsoever. And I believe in very, very strict enforcement by our judiciary. I think we need to continue pressure on the judiciary to ensure that where we have crimes that involve any level of violence, that the ultimate or whatever is the most significant of penalties is applied in order to act as a deterrent. I'm pleased that the City of Toronto, uh, the province actually, gave some funding to the City of Toronto and that the City of Toronto directed some of that funding to 31 Division. So that is part of a solution. Policing is part. Encouraging our youth. But it's not just in our city that we have crime, it's throughout the city. And what bothers me most is we could have a shooting in the Islington Steel's pocket, and yet somehow on the media, it's Jane Finch community. It's always the Jane Finch community. I think the media plays a big part in stigmatizing our area, and I think we need to be a little more active and proactive with the media to ensure that we are not stigmatizing or continuing that stigmatization of what is thank a you. very vibrant area. Thank it you. concerns me. Oh, sorry. My Thank you. Um. The City of Toronto has laid off uh, about 800 officers over the last few years. Uh, in its wisdom, I, I didn't agree with it. I don't agree with it. Uh, recently, I moved a motion to add another 100 officers, which passed through council, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to, to say uh, we'll see new officers at 31 Division shortly. Um, I also moved a motion for gun amnesty because I believe that there is an argument to be made that uh, if, you, if you provide some groceries perhaps to individuals that know where some guns might be lying uh, around, they might just trade them in for those particular groceries. I think that, that you've got to deal with it in an interim way, uh, in a, in a short-term way, uh, and a long-term uh, way. The short-term I just spoke about, long-term it's about, uh, in my opinion, getting to the children, creating some mentorship programs, providing jobs for those kids, through the private sector, 
not through, not through uh, welfare checks, but government sector, making sure uh, that we look at our particular situation of income, which is very low in our pocket, and, and start providing for, uh, for avenues where people can move in that are making some money. Once you start seeing people move into your community that are, they'll be spending more money, crime will go down. In Ward 7, crime did go down. And I'm saying it's because of the economic turn. It's because of that private investment that came in. And it's because of the jobs that, that were created with respect to that. Thank you. Mr. LaRose. Well, Madam Chair, I'm not sure. I, I did attend a CPLC meeting last mm -hmm. night. And I did hear Ron Tavener talk about that and the reduction in the number of uh, criminal activities, I think maybe essentially around the violence. Mm -hmm. But you know, for years we've been giving people all kinds of trinkets to turning their weapons, but yet the weapons are still out there. I don't think that's the solution. I think we have to change the culture within our community that says, let's lock them up, throw away the key. We've been doing that for years, but we still have the same magnitude of problem. What I will suggest to you that needs to happen is that we need to ensure that in our school system, they allow children to play again, run around, play, enjoy themselves, and become normal in individuals. Let them encourage the stabilization of families and have strong families in our community to look after the, the problems that families should be looking after, not police officers. We have police officers trying to deal with crazy people in the street, people who are mentally disturbed, and they're killing them. I worked in nursing for years as a crisis intervention nurse many years ago. I was out in those streets. We never pulled a shot on those people. We were able to talk them down into subduing themselves and coming into treatment and care. I think the fundamental problem is that we have lost the sight and vision about our humanity and we want to lock everyone up, but there's only so many limits that we can place on how many people we can put in locked up and pay for them. We have to look at turning that around. What can we do to create strong families, good cultural sense in self and community? Thank you. Right? Thank you. Amanda. I think that more police officers in the community is not the solution. I think that we need more programs for our children and for our youth that will help them to thrive in our community. I also think that um, we also need to invest more in our children and our youth, and we have to look at the precipitating factors. We have to look at the causes for why many of our youth are committing these crimes. High school dropout rate is one of them. A lot of our youth drop out of um, high school at a very um, young age. We have to figure out why this is happening. They need more employment. I run um, a program called Back to Basics Youth Support Services where I go into the prisons and I teach the men in their entrepreneurship and how to start their own business. And I find sometimes one of the reasons why many of them are reoffending is because there's not any employment opportunities out there for them. We tell these, peop these guys to go out there and be stand-up citizens, but we don't provide them with job opportunities, which is one of the reasons why they're out here reoffending. So one of the things that we need to do is get rid of a lot of these private agencies and try to get agencies in the community that will give these guys a, a job, give them employment opportunities so they don't have to be out here selling drugs to make an income. Thank you. Uh. Silence. Okay, Mr. Silence. You're taking away, ladies and gentlemen, you're just minutes away from having the opportunity to address the candidates yourself. Can we please be patient? I agree with, um, with Amanda. We need to create opportunities for young people, uh, real opportunities uh, for meaningful employment. We need to find ways to steer more and more and more young people away from gangs and guns. And we do that by supporting uh, programs that do that. That's why I supported the creation, for example, of a program called Teach to Learn, where we bring in young kids who are doing well, who teach other kids who are not doing so well, who connect them to a more positive lifestyle and give them a much clearer sense of direction and a much better path. I don't believe anyone 
in the city of Toronto should be walking around with a handgun in their pocket. That's why I voted to ban handguns. I believe that. I believe that very, very strongly. We need to do all we can to do that. I also want to say this. Councillor Mamalidi earlier talked about rezoning Ward 7 and growth and development. Weston and Finch is a planning disaster. Bringing that many units into such a confined space without adequate services, like community centers, like libraries, like grocery stores. And I'm sorry, George, Starbucks doesn't qualify. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Again, staying on the segment of policing. We've recently heard a lot of talk about bringing carding back. And that has not been received well by the black community. Do you support carding knowing that the black community has been disproportionately affected by this program? Deanna. Police need to have the tools they need to do the job that they have to do. That does not involve profiling any group or any community. That involves targeting individuals who are committing crimes regardless of race, regardless of gender. I am not in support of carding. I'm very supportive of, of some of the research that has been done that has suggest and suggested and proven that carding is not effective. What is effective is communication with the police, community participation, and uh, our policing uh, units getting involved and integrating with our communities and with representatives. What I see, and I'm very pleased to see with 31 Division, is a really concentrated effort to be integrated with the entire community and get to know where the problem park pockets are and the problem individuals. And those individuals can be, as I've said, of any race, any color, and any gender. So we can't be blinded, we need to be open, but we need to also support our police and give them the tools that they need to do a very important job in our community. Thank you. I think I've already made myself clear publicly that I, I do believe in, in giving the, the police the resources that they need. And if you talk to any of the officers out there, they will tell you straight up that the minute that we, we got rid of the so-called carting, uh, that's when things started to happen uh, in an increase. That's when, that's when the, the shootings in, in, in Toronto uh, uh, maxed out. That's when the guns started to play out in our parks. That's when innocent people started to, be, started, started to get shot uh, increasingly in the city of Toronto. I believe in carding in a form. I don't believe in the uh, former uh, a part of... Uh Silence. Silence. I You're going to have to hold it. I believe Please hold your comments. I, I, believe that, I believe that intelligence is important and the police do know uh, the people that might be up, up to no good. And I think that they should be asked questions periodically, uh, even if it is on the streets. Uh, I think that we've seen it play out in a negative way and I think we do need to bring some form of carding back. Now, with, just with respect, just, just with respect Quiet. to... Quiet, okay. You, doesn't matter. You, you, you can be rude Ladies if you like. Ladies and gentlemen, At the end of the day, this if is you want to hear the answer, and, and you're going to have to be quiet. It is, it is, it is my opinion, and I, I believe that it's needed. And I also believe that, you, that many people are burying their heads in the sand with respect to what's going on. Our criminals, those that are holding the guns and want to kill people, are in our community and they are being harbored in our social housing units. We must realize this because I've seen it firsthand with the police. If all of you want to keep talking about social programs and helping children and do the things that we've done over the last 60 years in this pocket, it is redundant folks. We have got to do something drastic 
to make sure that that this doesn't happen again okay. and and Thank we you. have to make sure that the police get police get the resources that they need on an interim basis to take care of the problem that exists in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. LaRose. Well, I think it's been made clear by the council where he stands on those issues. Let's listen, please. But let me tell you where I stand on that issue. I was around when South Africa was giving out cards to ordinary citizens in the street so that they could just walk their own streets in which they were born to identify who they were. And this country stood up and fought against that. Canada did. And now look, we are in Canada giving cards to black people and others just for walking the streets. Now that turns it upside down in the head about democracy. It's an outrageous suggestion. The police should be spending their time not trying to create culture within a society and do social programs. Police should put the energy and the effort where they need it. When they took them away, when we had that World Conference meeting here in Toronto, and they took the Tavis Task Force all the way downtown, we had not one criminal incident in this community. Not one. They were all gone. I can tell you this. More police is not the solution. What the solution is, taking those dollars and training young people, giving them capacity to perform work, bring back the culture of work as an ethic, the value of work. Create your strong you. neighborhoods, right? We, we, will not, we will not tolerate those politicians who will continue to sing the same old song, bring police officers here, let's get rid of them and put some people in there that can make things better. Yes, thank you. Amanda. When the description of many of the individuals in our community who are being targeted is black, I don't support Cardin. I raised a young son who um, w often walks home from school by himself, that takes the bus by himself, and my fear is that when Dave Cardin comes back, he'll be a uh, suspect because he's black and wearing a hoodie, or black and wearing jeans, which is often the description of people who are being carded in our ward. I, about two months ago, there was a 14-year-old boy who was handcuffed and put to sit on the lawn right behind 4400 Jane Street just because he was running at the time when they said that they were looking for a, a suspect who was black and wearing a hoodie and had on jeans, and he fit that description. So I don't support Cardin. I also think that, as Deanna said, that um, our police officers at 31 Division are doing a good job. Our community respondent officers are trying, with trying to build trust with the people in the community. And that's, main, that's one of the main problems is that that trust is broken. The community do not trust the officers. And I feel like we need to find ways where we can develop that trust back, find ways where we can start programs where the police have more opportunities to engage with the community. Um, our officers, our community respondent officers have been present at many of the barbecues, many of the, of the community meetings, and that's a start. So I think we just need to find ways where we can build that trust again between officers and the community. And no, I do not support Cardin, 100% not. I didn't, uh, I, didn't, I didn't support a process that inordinately stopped a certain number of people in our community and uh, resulted in a card. So that's why I didn't support, um, I didn't support carding and I supported uh, stopping uh, the practice of carding. Uh, I also believe though that we need to change uh, the way policing is done in our community. We need more community police. We need police that better understand and have better linkages uh, with local communities, that they understand them better, that they work with, the, with local kids, that they get to know the neighborhoods uh, much, much better than, than uh, what's currently occurring. And we need to continue to push uh, uh, for that, uh, uh, for that to, uh, to take place. I also believe that the way you get to solutions is by involving the community. Some months ago, for example, um, Andrea Tabner uh, from Fergrove, actually from the, from the Ward 7 portion of the uh, of the new, uh, the old Ward 7 portion of the new writings, came to me and said, look, Anthony, you know what? I'm really worried for the kids in the neighborhood. Something needs to be done because we're hearing all kinds of rumors, all kinds of noises that, that it's a melting pot and it's about to go. So I immediately convened a high-level meeting with the police and, and, uh, and the community to sit down and figure out how we could deal with that particular situation 
And quite frankly, that's the way to do it. You bring people together, you have, you have in-depth discussions, you information share, uh, and you get from the police as well information that the community needs, and then together you work on those solutions. And I think that we did that, and it worked well. And that's what we need to continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. In winding down the moderator section, I want to share with you some information that uh, uh, came out of a report by the Jane and Finch Task Force. Added to that, I want to share on behalf of homeowners in the Black Creek, uh, Humber River uh, area. Uh, as one homeowner said to me today, uh, we are taxpayers, we're homeowners, we're proud homeowners that have lived in this region for quite some time. We foot the bill for all of these social services and uh, um, programs that are being run with our property taxes and, and other forms of tax that the homeowners um, have to absorb. But yet still they get very little help uh, from their city councilors in ensuring that their neighborhoods are safe. They also are concerned about the fact that the lack of economic opportunities that exist within this area mean that they become targets as homeowners for crime. Uh, and in order to ensure that we break the cycle of poverty in this area, we need to create generational wealth. We need to create a situation where there is an opportunity for generational wealth within this district. Here are the reports by the Jane and Finch Task Force. A lack of economic opportunities is further exacerbated by a lack of businesses within the Jane and Finch community. That there are situations of being able to hire new employees. It, is also, it, it also needs to be mentioned that the women, especially uh, the high cost of childcare and the long waiting list for childcare spots were major barriers to a woman's gainful employment. Private and temporary employment agencies uh, fill the area and have proven to be a huge barrier to economic prosperity for many residents in the Jane and Finch. Most of the jobs available to this community are provided through these agencies that can only offer underpaid and unstable employment to community members with no medical benefits and no paid sick days. This part-time and temporary work, often a day at a time, provided only sporadic opportunities for employment, causing residents problems and having, uh, in, in being able to budget and make regular financial commitments, therefore burdening, uh, putting the cost of, and burden more so on the families. What do you have to say about that, Mr. Pruitt? I thought you were going to start in the middle there at one time, but that's okay. I'm, ha I'm, ha I'm, ha I'm happy to go first. Um, I couldn't agree more. We need to find ways to create opportunities for people for meaningful employment. Uh, we are doing some of that work currently. I believe that when you have significant investments in our neighborhood with significant public projects, community benefits needs to flow that from that. That's why I support community benefits agreements. In fact, uh, uh, with, the, with the new French project, we're working with a group called CAPG to do just that, to, ex to extract some significant community benefits uh, for, uh, for the community, both in terms of employment and creating employment opportunities, as well as creating, uh, the, uh, creating a, a, a place where the community can gather for, for a whole number of uh, different reasons. The other thing that I can do as a city councilor and what I have done, in my office, I created, immediately upon getting elected 12 years ago, I created an internship program where, where we take in, four, depending on how many we can accommodate, four or five eager young people. And, you know, we give them three, four months at City Hall to A, gain, gain experience. We create projects for them to organize, gain experience, and B, give them opportunities to be able to network. Many of them, Many of them I see walking around, the, uh, walking around the halls of City Hall, they're still working down there. They connect it to real jobs, real jobs that pay uh, real wages and all of the other benefits that come with it. 
A number of them have gone off to other opportunities elsewhere. But, uh, but that's, how, that's the way you do it. We created over, I think, over 100 internship positions to do that, to give young people experience and access to opportunity. That's something I can do very directly, and that's something I'm going to continue to Thank do. Thank you. Amanda. Um, I agree with that report with that report, especially with childcare. I have many friends and there's many women in the community who can't work or who can't go to school because the cost of childcare is about what $1,758 a month. Some people don't even get paid that much. We need to find more places that we can use for childcare. There's many buildings that have those spaces, particularly on the first floors that are being used and being used but not per the way it should be for the community and we should look into those spaces and see how many of those spaces can we allocate for childcare, subsidized childcare spaces in the community. Also we do have a lot of abandoned buildings as well throughout the city that we can turn into childcare. We have many women, many young mothers in our community who have gone to school to get their ECE certificates who are just eager to get a chance to run a daycare center or to even have the opportunity to work there and having more childcare centers would definitely allow these um, our young mothers in the community and families to go out there and work and continue their education in school. Also, I think that we need more economic opportunities with the development that's happening and we need to ensure that all these businesses that are coming into the community are going to employ people who reside in our neighborhoods and that's not going to be people coming outside of the neighborhoods coming in here to work. And also, I think that um, we need to look into entrepreneurship more um, and giving people in the community opportunities to not just work for businesses, but to own their own. Um, yeah, to own their own. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. LaRose. Silence. Well... Well, you remember I told you earlier that there is good news on the horizon. There really is good news. You know, listen, we have subways going now up to Vaughan. That's major infrastructure. We have a new stadium at York University. We have magnificent enterprising developments going to be happening in the, Woodburn, in the Woodbine area. And that is definitely on track. And we have what we call Toronto Community Benefits Network where we've been securing commitments to provide job training and job opportunities and acquisition of contract communities from the city government of Toronto, from these developers, to ensure that we bring this work to the area. Now, six years ago, in 2012, I came up with a plan called the Jane Finch Economic Community Initiative, which spelled out exactly this. That's before the rivers were built. And it said, we will train people with the specific skills, bringing in union members. I even showed that to Mr. Peruzza many years ago. I said, we need to bring in, at the Jane and Finch intersection, we need a BIA, a business improvement area set up there. I suggested that that intersection that has been so badly maligned should be the center of growth and development. Well, we don't want machinery, storage, tank, and equipment maintenance facilities next to the mall. We want that plan that Peter Lopretti had many years ago to fill that place with intensified development, retail, commercial business. This will bring jobs, the building of those buildings. We're going to redevelop the entire community in the best interest of the community itself. We're going to ensure that the local people are trained to get those jobs, not bringing in the workers from outside to get the magnificent job that's paying $100 an hour or some nonsense like that. I'm saying to you that if you erect, elect the right person who has the vision and foresight, who has been monitoring this situation, who has been proposing plans to make it happen, then you're going to get the change that you need and that you deserve. Thank A Jane Finch, that Thank is going to be the new economic hub for the Jane Finch and the Greater T GTA area. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that, that everybody's talking about revitalization. It's been a part of my platform this whole election. Revitalization is the only real way to get ourselves out of this particular rut that we have. And, and that's real. And, and the only way to do that 
is to look at our, our, our land, look at our properties, look at what we've got, and decide together what planning, uh, what plan planning instruments we can bring forward to make those changes. I've brought to you a number of different options. One of them is our social housing properties. It's huge, hundreds of acres of land, old, decrepit housing. Tenants should not have to live in that particular housing. We can knock it down and rebuild with the private sector. And when the private sector comes to the table, it is refreshing. It is refreshing. We've seen it at Regent Park, Lawrence Heights, and we're going to see it at Fergrove as well soon. And we're going to see it at Jane and Finch if I get elected. When I become the council of this area, revitalization will become the main focus for myself. I must tell you that a subway is a part of that, not the LRT. We need to get rid of this plan that Councillor Peruzza has pushed through uh, with parking trains across the street from the mall. We literally, in the Jane and Finch corridor now, are going to be on the other side of the tracks. Are we proud of that? The only thing that can work for us is real investment. And I want to thank the former Councillor Lepretti for bringing the subway to the table. He's the one that brought the subway to York University, not Councillor Peruzza, as he's telling thank everybody you. door to door. It was, it was Councillor Lepretti that did it, and I thank him for that. Thank now you. we need one along Finch Avenue. You start doing that, and I tell you this, there isn't a single pocket in our community from Keel Street right over to the airport that investors won't come in if they know the subway's coming along Finch Avenue. They will invest and they will help you pay for thank that you. particular structure. Thank you, Mr. Mamo. Thank you. Deanna. I don't want to make uh, comments personal, but I find it uh, very disturbing that we're talking about a transit, transit. This community needed transit discussions 20 years ago. I agree, Lepretti fought for that subway and got us a subway. But I was a student at York University 25 years ago and we talked about a subway. We can't get a subway in 20 years. We need development now, we need investment now. The community has been neglected for far too long. The task force report is dead on. It talks about a tremendous amount of serious issues. We need to have more child care support for the families, for the single mothers, so that women can get back into the workforce. We need to be creating better jobs for our community members. We need to also give them the tools to do that, those jobs. We need to bring the unions in to meet with various young people. Let's bring them into our pockets. We've had many years at the local level where we've had opportunities to bring about change. And I'm sorry, but I suggest very strongly that we've not met those requirements, that we have for far too long ignored our communities. There is so much we can do, so much we will do, when you have a strong advocate at the table, when you have someone who can communicate with all levels of government, with all different private investors, private corporations, our banks, and encourage them to develop in the riding of Humber River Black Creek. We Thank have you. people who want to find jobs. We have York University, the hub of education. We can encourage internships and programs there. We can integrate with our unions. There is a lot we can do when we have someone advocating at the city level for each and every one of us and all of our Thank communities. You. Thank you. Final question to the moderator. It's a two-part question. There is follow-up. One last moderator, the audience will be able to ask their questions. So our floor walkers, if you could get your audience members prepared, we will take a small number of questions. The follow-up question that I have to everybody uh, in response to the last question that was asked is that the Humber River, what is clear to the Humber River Black Creek community is that they want a fighter. They want a fighter in City Hall that is going to speak for the entire community, not just a small few. This historical community, as I opened up and said, has the demographics, uh, of, uh, has the demographics of approximately 12% Italian, 9% East Asian, 8% Jamaican, but a total of 73% visible minority. 
It is the perfect and most beautiful mix of individuals from various different cultures. How can you ensure that you will, you will be able to turn the stigma around from a community with such a dense ethnic combination from a negative to a positive? <laughs> okay, the, the, the area is stigmatized negatively because it is dense, but it is a very densely populated ethnic area. And that has given it a certain amount of uh, negative stigma attached to it. How can you take that information and turn it to a positive so that people look at the Black Creek Humber River area as a heavily ethnic area, but for the positive, not for the negative? What plans would you have in, in, in putting that together? And I'm so sorry, I apologize. This, the follow-up question to the original question didn't get asked. The follow-up question was, um, the, with the investments from private sector, the idea that Mr. Mamalidi has of, of uh, the uh, revitalization uh, the LRT and uh, some other ideas that Mr. Peruzza has, the business sector uh, hub that Mr. LaRose has. Are you prepared to commit to ensuring that the residents of the Humber River Black Creek, that there is some sort of quota system put in place to guarantee that the residents of the Humber River Black Creek have a minimum percentage of the jobs that are being offered as a result of the new infrastructure and, and building um, uh, of, uh, from investments from private sector. Many communities uh, outside of the Humber River Black Creek have requirements to have a minimum percentage of local residents employed in these positions, these well-paying positions. Are you prepared to fight and vie for that a minimum requirement, uh, whether it be a percentage um, a, or a, a hard number, as to the, to the number of people that must come from the community in order to be employed in these positions. That was the follow-up question, so sorry. 30 seconds, yes or no. Mr. Prutza. As I understand it, a couple of things. One, you asked earlier, how do you remove stigmas? Right. Well, you that stop labeling people, you stop name calling, you stop saying you're gonna, you know, knock down their homes with a sledgehammer. What you do is exactly, cause then, cause then people get scared. They say, he's gonna knock down my homes, he's gonna take the land and give it off to his developer friends for high rise intense development without any kind of community benefits. So you stop that, you bring people together. What you tell them is that you have a plan. At Fir Grove, we have a plan, the housing is falling down. We're gonna rebuild it, but we're gonna rebuild it with the community that's living there. We're, you know, we're gonna re rebuild it with them at the table. We're gonna rebuild it with the broader community, and we're gonna re rebuild it in a way that makes sense for everybody, both the, the people that currently live there and the, and the rest of the area. Edgley Village, we're gonna do the same thing. It sounds like he's, he, he invented this himself. He wrote the policy. He did not. We've been doing it at Regent Park. We've been doing it at Lawrence Heights, and we're gonna do it, and we're gonna do it in this community Thank as well. You. He's just scaring people, and and that's bad, that's bad for all of us because it creates divisions, it creates suspicions, it points the finger, it says, all oh, those folks are to blame for our woes. We need to stop that. Thank you. We yeah, need that's to right. absolutely. Mr. Peruzza, um, you need to, you did, and you also need to very quickly answer the question. Sorry guys, it's, I'm, I'm, I must be getting tired. <laughs> um, you need to quickly answer the question um, in regards to the employment opportunities uh, to your residents. Are you guaranteeing your residents the high paying job opportunities that will be coming uh, into this area as a result of the... The high paying... The, the, the high paying... About 30 seconds, seriously, absolutely. it's yes or no. The high, paying, <laughs> the high paying jobs that provide people skills. That's why we're working on community benefits packages that flow from these investments, that, that flow from these investments okay. to do precisely that, to give local people those opportunities and the opportunity to those Thank high you. paying jobs. Thank you. Amanda? 
this is exactly one of the reasons why I'm running. <laughs> I am part of that stigmatization. Number one, living in Toronto community housing and being a single mother. And I'm trying to break those barriers and I'm trying to get rid of that stigmatization that's associated with single mothers, that's associated with the black community, that's associated with people living in Toronto community housing. One of the things that I do plan to do if I'm elected is ensure that development works for the residents and for the people that live in Ward 7. I want to ensure that they do get high paying jobs, the jobs that are going to be offered through this development. I also fought for better job fairs in our community, ones that are not McDonald's and Burger Kings, the typical ones that come to our community, but for job fairs that lead to career opportunities. And this is something that I want to see continue to happen in our community, and I want to continue to be an effective and strong voice for those people who reside in Ward 7 who feel that they have not been properly represented for the past couple of years. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rose. You can do a two-in-one answer for us well, really quickly. Yeah, it's a two-part question. So the stigmatization issue, of course, and ensuring that we're able to get back into the work opportunities that come. Let's start with the work opportunity there. There's a Toronto Community Benefits Network that has several organizations on this wing that is guaranteeing, it's got signed contracts with the City of Toronto, with the contractors and the builders and the developers to ensure that we are going to get those jobs. There's no question about that, so that's going to happen. I want to mention quickly to you about stigmatization. You know, year, many, many years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago, when I used to go down to Harlem, Bedford Stuyves and places like that, negative spaces, cockroaches and all kinds of things like that, drug, heroin. In no time, it became gentrified, they moved those people out, and now you can't afford to buy in those spaces. That's what they want to do with Jane Finch. I say to you, stay in Jane Finch. Don't let them push you out. Buy some land. Ensure that you invest in this community. The change will come to the name. Mr. Peruzza thought that if you change the name, people will come and invest. It doesn't happen that way. I would suggest to you, if you make this community better and give opportunities for investment, all kinds of people are going to come here and they're going to take it over and push you out if you're not secured Thank in you. it and I will ensure that you have a place in it and you don't get pushed out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Mr. Mamalidi. I don't think it's the, uh, the ethnic community. Silence, please. I don't think it's the ethnic part of our community that, that is stigmatized. I don't think it's, I think we should I think we should be celebrating who we are in every ethnicity that brings uh, br that, that that we have in our particular community. I think it's poverty that is that is the, the root of our stigma. I think we need to get rid of our poverty in in our particular community, and nobody really wants to talk about that. They want to talk. They want to talk really quick about how to how to spend more more government money and how to bring social workers and how to bring uh, welfare checks and bring everything to to Jane and Finch the way it is. At the end of the day, there's only one way to deal with this, and that's my plan. That that is to make sure that Jane and Finch looks and feels better, and you can do that almost instantly with policy. I wrote the affordable housing policy, Anthony. I wrote it. And, 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 and Regent Park and Lawrence Heights got knocked down and rebuilt in a mix because I wrote that policy when I was the chair of the affordable housing committee. I want to bring that to the Jane and Finch corridor. And yes, when that happens, and you'll have to excuse me. Silence. You'll have to excuse me be, be, because you, you, gave, you gave somebody else a bit of time here. Uh, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the way we did it at Regent Park and Lawrence Heights is the way we're going to do it at Jane and Finch. Anything that gets rebuilt in this particular corridor, everybody has to sign some kind of a, of a document that says jobs will come out to the local community. We did it at Regent Park, we did it at Lawrence Heights, and we're going to do it at Jane and Finch. And by the way, Anthony, you keep saying to everybody that the, the subway is yours when it was La Prete's, and now you're saying Firgrove is yours. As a matter of fact, it was me who decided at one point that people can't live in mold, and you've got to, you've got to give people a decent place to live. Quiet. And Firgrove, Firgrove, is, Firgrove was, was a part. Silence. I, 
I am the I am the counselor for that area. I still am. And it's Firgrove that I decided to move forward with the mix. And since then, Councillor Perutz has tried to take over the agenda and keep it welfare. I'm not just going to keep it welfare. We are going to have a mix at Firgrove. It's going to be a mix of everybody. And we are going to stop segregating this community because that's what's causing our problem. Thank you. Deanna. Just briefly in reply, we talk, uh, we've had both councillors talk to us about Firgrove, and yet I've been at at least five meetings over the past six months, and the only person at this table at those meetings is Winston LaRose. I have a concern with that. If we're going to talk about a pocket in our riding, we need to know it, we need to visit it, and we need to connect with the residents. I can tell you, we talked about, the question was asked about the diversity of Humber River Black Creek. It's not limited to Jane Finch. The entire beautiful riding, anyone from any street, whether it's in the uh, <coughs> east section or the west section, recognizes the diversity. And I agree with Councilor Mamaliti that we need to embrace that diversity. It's not a stigmatization. It's a, it is a positive. We have restaurants of every type. We have cultures of every type. We need to continue to encourage that. But we do that by bringing in investments. We need businesses to employ our residents we need to guarantee that if there is going to be a community hub built at Jane and Finch or an LRT or a subway, regardless of what project that is, that a percentage of the jobs, the good jobs, go to our residents. That will bring improvement. You empower a community when you give them jobs not jobs as Amanda shared at McDonald's or at the Jerk Chicken Villa. You empower them by giving them quality jobs. We have the education hub and we have hard working residents who want to go to work, but we've got to give them an opportunity to earn a good wage so they can afford the expensive housing in Toronto, so that they have benefits for their children, so that they can afford daycare. It is a cyclical approach and it involves looking at the entire area of Humber River Black Creek and working across the area. And when we look at the area and I, I apologize, but I do not see infrastructure. I do not see good employment opportunities in any section of our community. And that is a shame. It is unacceptable. It doesn't exist anywhere else in Toronto. And we need to stop. We need it. We have a new ward. We're going to have a new voice. I believe you need a strong advocate at City Hall. And we need to fight together for the entire Thank community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If I can have our floor monitors uh, now locate, uh, maybe Medea, if you can locate your uh, first uh, question from the audience, if you can locate the individual that uh, you have selected. I can tell you uh, right now, our online has uh, blown right up and uh, you guys are doing a fabulous job. Unfortunately, we will not get to these online questions. Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, answer them ourselves. Um, you took my pen, Deanna. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, while our uh, floor walkers are getting the um, audience members ready for their questions, we're going to be very kind and thoughtful to our candidates and give them a two-minute break. Two minutes. Thank you so very much. We're going to turn over the remaining um, sec uh, segments of the evening to you. The, um, the guests in the theater this evening. And we do have some names selected. Please do not take offense. If we don't get to you, we'll do our very best. The first question is coming from Mr. George Chaka Chuku. Mr. George Chuku. Can we give the microphone to Mr. George Chuku, please? My question for, you know, for the candidates is this. There has been an epidemic of uh, homelessness in Toronto. And uh, we have seen so many beggars coming at the intersections of the city. If you were elected, what would you do to help to eradicate and reduce such homelessness and the number of beggars that are in our streets today? 
Mr. Uh, George, Thank would you. you be so kind as to direct that to one candidate only because of time, please? And if we do have an opportunity to give the other candidates a 30 second follow up, that will be fine. Okay, let me ask that to okay. Judy Segro. Uh, I mean, is that, <laughs> did I call to Judy or did I call your mom's name? <laughs> well, anyway, go ahead. I get, I get that all the time. And, you know, it's a compliment. Uh, it's absolutely a compliment. Um, so homelessness and begging are two different questions. Uh, the issue of begging on the street um, is, is truly sad. Uh, it, we're dealing, I think, with uh, elements probably more related to mental illness than homelessness when we're thinking and reflecting on the beggars that we see on the streets. So I would like to see more opportunity to uh, get treatment and help those individuals. As it pertains to homelessness, well, we come back then to affordable housing. Oh, did you want us to be 30 seconds? Sorry. We'll give you two minutes because you're the only candidate that uh, has been requested to speak on the matter. 30 seconds for a follow-up by the other candidates. Okay, thank on you. On point. Thank Thanks. you. So in terms of homelessness, as I was saying, we come back to affordability and dealing with affordability in our community. We need, again, I'll repeat myself, we need to work with all levels of government, particularly the federal and provincial governments, because Toronto does bear the burden of a high propensity of new immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. So the level of demand in our community for housing far exceeds the level of demand in surrounding areas. So it's imperative that that governments at all levels support uh, the provision of affordable housing in our community and that the City of Toronto residents who pay property taxes don't bear the full burden of that challenge. Thank you. Mr. Mamalidi, would you like to take 30 seconds to add to that? One of the reasons that we've, we're bearing this problem is because of the, the refugee policy that exists. What's happened and what, what it policy reads as is that the minute refugees come into our city, they take the spot of everybody else that's, that might be, might be waiting for either affordable housing or social housing spots. So that's kind of pushed because we've got this huge influx okay. of... Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So because we have this huge influx, I'm sorry, you've given everybody uh, extensions. Uh, I seem to be getting cut off all Finish the time. Finish your statement. Finish your statement. At the end of the day, Stop. at the end of the day, at, at the end of the day, do you want to deal with the homeless problem or not? Because okay. at the end of the day, it, at the end of the day, it's about, it's about no spots left. Nobody's giving us funding to deal with it. The proper way to deal with homelessness is resource housing, not, not social housing, not to, to put the homeless in social housing, because many of them are suffering from mental illness or addiction. The way to deal with it is to find out why they're homeless, find out what their addictions are, try and get them off the substance, and the only way to do that is with resource housing. We need that built and nothing Thank else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. LaRose, 30 seconds if you can, please. Uh, one, one of the things that I'm committing to do is to get the people who are mentally ill back into the hospitals where they should be getting treatment. Let's stop treating people with medications in the street and all that kind of silly policy that is coming into governance. I think homelessness has been a progressive evolution of faulty governance over the years. My effort will be to get them off the streets and into institutions where they belong, provide job and create a more caring society. Fantastic, thank you. Amanda? Um, I've had the opportunity to work at various shelters throughout the city, and as a community support worker working in these shelters, many of the people who come into these shelters are people who suffer from mental health illnesses and substance abuse problems. They were people who have lived in houses but didn't have the proper resources to help them maintain those houses or to pay their rent. So we definitely need more resources to help many of the people who are on the streets and those living with substance abuse problems and mental health illness is to ensure that they can continue to be housed and continue to get the support that they need. Thank you. Mr. Peruzza? Correct. Amanda is bang on. We need mo more mental health supports for people, and we need a more accommodating uh, shelter, um, shelter system. Thank you so much. Uh, Artem. Artem here. Okay, if you could uh, find a way to the host to give you the microphone. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my question is... We, I can only direct it to one candidate, right? Uh, we would prefer that, okay. yes. So uh, then I direct it to Mr. Peruzza, 
it's open for everyone, but uh, the educational element is probably just for Mr. Perutz and the others group. You support the banning of handguns, and I assume you are talking about the legal ones, because criminals are already breaking the law, and uh, they don't care about the laws you pass, they're already breaking it. Um, just so you know, criminals do not buy handguns legally, because it takes a year to get a license and buy a handgun legally. They're easily traceable, and unlike a lot of criminals who get released, legal gun owners actually get criminal checks done every single day. There's an officer sitting at their SMP who does a criminal check every day for, on them. They've invested time and money and are not usually involved in illegal activity. So my question to you is, how are you going to deal with illegal firearms on our streets? Two minutes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for the opportunity to elaborate on that one. What we have now is we have a situation of kids basically killing kids with handguns. Our police statistically say that uh, most gun crimes are created by legally 50%, 50 to 60% of gun crimes are, are, are done by legally purchased weapons here. There is no question that there is a, that there is a portion of handguns that come across the border. And I also supported at council, um, you know, asking the federal government and the provincial governments to crack down on the illegal importation of handguns. But I still believe that there is no reason, no reason whatsoever, why somebody should be able to have, get access to a handgun, be walking around on our streets, and especially when you put those handguns in, 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 in the pockets of kids. Kids who, who often can't make rational decisions with what they're going to do. And, uh, and, I, and I think that one of the ways that, that, we, that we get to that level of crime is we gotta get to the guns, and we gotta get the guns um, uh, we got to get at the guns. We don't want, uh, and I don't want, American style, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, crime here. And, uh, and, and, and quite frankly, if we don't crack down on the guns, we're going to have American style uh, crime here. And, uh, and we need to resist that, and we need to fight that with all we got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are we good with that? Do we require a 30 second follow up from anybody? Sure. Is there anybody wanting to follow oh, that up? Yeah. Amanda? Um, so, yeah, I, I agree that there should be, um, handguns should be banned. And exactly with what Perusa said, many of our youth, many people um, in general, they react before they even think. If a lot of the handcuffs were off the street, there would be less more people who are dying. If without handguns, many people would find other ways to solve these problems instead of resorting to killing each other. As I said before, we often react before we even take the time to think, how better can I solve this problem? So I agree. I think handguns should be banned, completely banned off our streets. Thank you. Mr. LaRose, 30 seconds. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I believe that um, we have a gun culture in this country. And uh, should we ban the gun culture? I'm concerned about the fact that we're talking about guns and people are knifing, stabbing each other to death, and violence is rampant. What we need to do is have a culture, a socialization process that don't place the issue of the vitality of guns and weapons and violence. We're not doing that in our school system. Let's start teaching our children in the school to love, respect, and to be disciplined. They Thank you. go around the schools with baggy pants and the pants below their ba waist and this kind of stuff. I think we have got the false sense of culture that is not teaching people to be responsible and to love each other and to respect them to Thank the point you. that they want to kill them. Thank them you, sir. Each other. Thank you. Okay. 30 seconds, Mr. Mamalidi. Yeah, I, I, I truly believe that uh, one of the reasons that, that guns are an issue, and first of all, I'm not going to punish legal... Um, uh, firearms, uh, people that are law-abiding and go through the process and the law to buy their guns. They're not the ones shooting up people in parks. They're not the ones shooting people, innocent bystanders. I haven't seen that happening. 
So I won't agree. I don't agree with that. What I do agree with is how we're raising our children, and it should be family values that come first. It should be parenting that we should be questioning. We should be asking ourselves the question as to why a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old is going out at three o'clock in the morning at Jane and Finch, and where where are the parents to allow where? them to do that? Those are the kinds of questions that we need to bring forefront. That's why they're holding illegal guns and are going to continue holding illegal guns and killing people unless we're real about what's really happening out Thank there. Thank you. Thank you. Deanna, did you have any 30 seconds to add to that? Yes, uh, I support the banning of handguns, but that is not a sufficient solution to the issue. There's much more that has to be done, uh, and that starts from our children and our youth. Thank you. S uh, Sir Worthy, I, you have some questions? Please go ahead. Hello. Okay. Uh, my question is for Giorgio Mamaluti. Um, the tenants that you say you want to evict out of the Jane and Finch area, you said that you want to get rid of the criminals and gangbangers. My question is, what about the tenants who are not criminals and gangbangers? You still want to evict them, right? And what happens to, are, are they going to be able to come back to Jane and Finch when you take down the, the buildings and replace them, renovate, or not renovate, replace them with you know, some condos that we probably cannot afford? Are they going to be able to come back, or how does that work? So uh, how the policy works, and again, I wrote that policy, is that, no, I don't want to evict. What happens is, and, and first of all, let me just say, there is a, parcia, a portion of TCHC tenants that I do want to evict, and they're that 1% of the, the drug dealers, the gun carrying, the illegal gun carrying people, and the ones that will kill you on the spot. Yes, I do want to evict them. 1%. Okay, that's what I said, and that's what I maintain, and that's what I'm going to keep saying. Now, with respect to the, to the tenants themselves, I don't want to evict tenants. I want to give them a better place to live. And the way to do that is not to carry, carry on with hundreds of acres of land of decrepit housing, mold-infested housing, that we can't even repair. That is, a, that is a social problem that exists in our community. What I'm suggesting is to do exactly what we did and I did at Regent Park in Lawrence Heights because I wrote the policy. That is to gradually, to gradually uh, come, up, come up with a plan. I know that they're being instructed to do this, but it doesn't matter to me. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it is about protecting- Silence, silence. It is about protecting the tenants and the rights, okay. the rights of the tenants. And quite frankly, now is the time to do that. Thank you. We gradually take on a parcel of land over the years. We ask tenants, yes, we ask them to take on another residence uh, somewhere in the GTA temporarily until we're finished rebuilding the way we did at Regent Park. That's how it works. They get first cracks at coming back when, they're, when their unit is ready to come in. But at the same time, at the same time, what, what, what makes this work is that the segregation stops and you start building a mixed portion of our community, everybody living together and not segregated just with the poor. That is Thank so you. key Thank to this you, policy. So whoever told you that, I am sure, belongs to one of these other camps up here that are trying to make, Pass. trying to sway what I'm saying. Pass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We go through all the time. The box being passed from one hand to the other. Look. Where are these criminals going to go? We keep producing them. So where are we going to send them? To another community somewhere? Or are we going to ban them from the country like they're starting to do? So if these people are here, they're born here, it's our problem. We haven't socialized them properly. And we talk about moving them to another community. It does not make sense. There's no logic in that whatsoever. But now, I do support the idea that we need to regenerate these facilities. We need to redevelop and revitalize, but ensure that the people that have lived there for 30 and 40 and 50 years, it's their community, it's their home. They need to have a right to buy back into those facilities. And the government should help them to do that. There's no question that they owe it to this community, particularly in Jane Pinch. And for those of Mr. Mamoriti's group, that he's been able to treat this way down there. We don't want that kind of conduct up here. Thank so make sure he doesn't Thank get elected you. here. Thank you, Mr. LaRose. Thank you. 
I'm going to be short and sweet. Okay. I agree with Amanda. We've had two councillors represent this entire area and allow the housing to get to the level that it is at now. We need change. We need that change now. We should have been paying attention to this issue 20 years ago, 15, 10, not today. 12 years too late. Ask Thank you. you. Is Brett Tim here? Should Bro, Tim. Maybe, your, maybe your mother will come up with some funding for the for the for the municipal. Is Bro, government. Tim here? Sure. Doctor Richard, is there Doctor Richard here? Doctor Richard, the microphone for Doctor Richard, please. We will take one question after this and wrap up our evening with closing remarks from our candidates. Doctor Richard. Good evening to the distinguished panel and the audience at hand. Um, my question first is twofold. First to um, Councillor, or former Councillor, Mamalidi. Uh, <laughs> our our um, mosaic is um, strive on what we call a multicultural. However, you've been, throughout the night, been um, wanted to eliminate segregation. I don't say multicultural is segregation, but the country gives us the, the right and the freedom to celebrate our cultural um, identity at specific time of the year. And, and it was recorded that with the Marcus um, Garvey Center, which celebrate the, mar the ideology of Marcus Garvey in the Black Diaspora um, to come in together to build their, um, their gifting and their talent. And, and it was, again, as I said, stated, um, well, I would say, why did you um, um, push forward to, to close the Marcus Garvey Center in the Jane and Finch area? Um, and, and, and also, um, to the general panel now, and. Um, back in the 80s, um, Peter Slowly and Reverend Jackman in the Regent Park had a Sunday morning soccer, soccer um, league, and, and which is pretty much community policing. And you know, Peter Slowly was one that is big on community um, policing, and which again is propelled and championed by the RCMP. Whereby now we have the RCMP who, um, by the mandate of the, our um, current Prime Minister Trudeau, who removed the, 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 the criteria to be a citizen since the, the 50,000 um, refugees has, um, came in. However, in the 80s and the 70s, when we have an influx of the, the black community, do you think that should be eliminated or put back in place so that those of us I had a, a degree from 2000, and when I applied for the RCMP, it was not, sir, I was sir, not you're going to have to streamline your question, the, your question, sir. The question, second part question is, if any of you had the opportunity to, to, to speak about um, not being a citizen, if you have a degree as a, a federal um, employee, would you, what is your viewpoint on that? Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get three, to ask three, to him to three questions that. into that. I'm just, uh, I'm a little. He, so it's I'll take, I'll take the first you, one, which is, uh, look, it, you know, question? culture, culture, Mark, I'll take culture, uh, now the, the the ladies on the top are really rude, and I'd I'd really like to just finish out. Quiet. And I, and I think again, I think it's being done on purpose. But at the end yeah. of the day, I'll okay, just keep speaking. You keep yelling. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna stay we'll focused. We're wrapping up right. now, ladies. If we can just at the end of give the day, the candidates uh, respect ethnicity and culture, or should I say, poverty is not culture. And if you want to celebrate poverty, I'm not with you. If you if you want to. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to, if you, I, my, my plan, my plan for this community, whether you want to hear it, 
So this is, these are the people that want to stay poor, you see? This is the people that want to stay poor. In one, hand, in one hand, we want to talk about getting ourselves out of poverty, and then when somebody, when somebody comes right. along and wants to do it without government money, we have an issue with that person. I want, right. I want to bring out my plan, which is a plan that will revitalize. Can you answer the okay. question? I, Why trying, did you close I'm, the Marcus I'm Garvey Center? I'm honestly trying to. I'm, okay. I'm honestly, and, and you're interrupting. It's right. worse. At the end, at the end, at the end of you, the day. You see, if, if, if one person gets two questions on this panel, and, all, and none of us get the chance for two minutes no, response. No, sir, you will this get, is you will get to respond. Itself, right? you how do you respond? So, Mr. Mamalidi, are you wrapped how, how up with that question? How can you possibly question? respond with everybody yelling? You can't. Okay. So, okay? if we can just so directly the answer day, the out, gentleman's question. Hear me out and either agree with me or you don't. Okay. All right? So, for me, it's not about culture. The c poverty is not a culture. It, it, it is miserable. And, and I don't want to celebrate that. I want to take you out of, out of poverty. That's what my plan does. Okay, and, and I know how to do that because I'm doing it in my area now. There are less okay. people under the affordable, the, under the, the poverty line in Ward 7 now than there were 18 years ago when we started our plan. As far as Marcus Garvey is concerned, yes, yes, Marcus yes. Garvey was supposed to come up with a plan to teach entrepreneurship to, to the youth. I opened that center. I'm the one that moved that center through council. It was my motion that did it. We moved it on Rivalda. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the people that chose to okay, run that we particular... Need to, we need to wrap it up. At the, at the end of the day, the people that chose to run that particular outfit stopped, in, in, in my eyes and in the eyes of the city, stopped, uh, stopped, prepare, stopped preparing a proper plan to get the youth that were that were not graduating in high school uh, a proper a proper a proper training program they stopped it completely and started to have parties outside of which the community started to complain about there was music until four o'clock in the morning they ended up not paying the rent for about two years and the city of toronto took the lease away from them it was irresponsible of the people that ran it don't don't sit here and don't let's, don't point your finger at a councillor who is doing we're his losing job. Control of this situation. I was doing my job. Right. Right. You didn't okay. manage it properly. You okay. didn't manage it properly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so and much. You still Thank owe the you city so of much. Toronto two years. Thank rent. you so much. Thank you so much. It's so unfortunate when we sit here today and we act in such a divisive polarizing way. This is not the way we need to move forward as a community. We need to talk about solutions. The center was a solution run properly. If in fact it turned a corner, we needed to get back in there and get it run properly, not shut it down. Thank it was you, in Deanna. the right target area. Mr. LaRose, 30 seconds, yeah, please, yeah. sir. Uh, Mad Madam Closing Chair, arguments what, will what come. I would suggest, because time has gone, considerable amount of time has gone by, some people are getting to respond and engage all of the time. And I don't think it's fair to the rest of us who have things to see as well. So what I'm going to suggest for whatever numbers of remaining questions, maybe it should be switched around. Perhaps we don't need as much time. But let's do some short tips where we can get this over. Yes, sir. Okay. See, so when it's my turn to respond, we want to shorten it. Uh, 30 seconds. Did you, did you have a response other than that? In regards to I, the I Marcus Garvey Center? I don't to address that, but I'm saying if one comes to get two turns of two minutes, and right. I don't, I, all I get is a 30 second response to each of them, I'm not getting an equal place at this table. Okay, I fair enough. That. Thank you for voicing that concern. We'll correct that. that right away. Um, the next question, did you have a response to that, Mr. Peruzza? The 30 seconds response to the question deals specifically with the Marcus Garvey Center. He doesn't is, even know what it is. Is, is, is what uh, he doesn't even know what it is. <laughs> Did you want to answer that question, um, Mr. Putza? Yes, I do know uh, the Marcus Garvey Center. I know where it is. I voted against you, George, at council when you when you closed it. Councillor Mamalidi has a very very peculiar style. I've witnessed it at a number of community meetings. When he feels that you are a group that is no longer with him. He turns on you and he shuts you down. That's what, this, that's what that was about and that's what he does. 
We've seen it over and over again. I saw it firsthand at the St. Basil's meeting with his great LRT versus subway debate. You know, when people wanted to present articulate, thoughtful views, he basically said, you don't live here, you shouldn't have a right to speak. Imagine that. That's what he does. He shut, he, if, you thinks, if he thinks you disagree with him, he shuts you down. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, there's, this is the last question we're gonna, and then we will give our counselors closing arguments. Um, Grant Evans? Grant? Yes? Barbara? Did I call Barbara? I think I did call Barbara earlier. No. Yeah. Okay. Is that Grant? Yes, yes it is. Hi, Grant. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, just a quick question. At the early part of the uh, session this evening, one of the, one of the points you mentioned was that you plan very well. And if you, I just wonder why, as I recall, if you plan so well, why is it that uh, you had to attend a meeting, a conference in Ottawa last year, and you charged the city over $500 a night for uh, staying at the Chateau Laurier Hotel, and took, us, uh, took a flight on a porter for over $700? That's the first one. The second one is, if you care so much about Jane and Finch, why is it that you say that 80% of the uh, residents of Jane and Finch don't pay TTC fares? That doesn't sound uh, particularly respectful. That one's for you. So there's two questions. I hope I'm allowed to answer without well, yelling. Well, you can but answer at, them at the end of the very day, quickly. The, the conferences are set by, in this particular case, it's, uh, it was an organization that we belong to as counselors. Uh, they pick the hotels and they make the reservations and, and flight arrangements. So that's the answer to that particular question. You, 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 know, that it, you know that I'm right. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, it's, it's, your job, it's, your, it's your job right now to try and, and, and do this, and it's fine. I'll answer the question, and I just did. Okay. The, with respect to the TTC, it's accurate. The TTC at Jane and Finch, uh, about 90% or more of the riders do not pay for their fees. And, and this is a policy, this is a, this is a, this is a policy, this is a pol, this is a policy that, this is a policy that TTC has. Can we settle down so we can hear, TTC's, so we can listen to his response? Please. TTC, TTC's policy Well, let is, him talk and then you'll get the answer. Go ahead. TTC's policy is not to ask any questions. So the drivers are instructed uh, if people don't put their fare in and aren't showing uh, their particular fare, they leave them alone. The drivers, drivers have told us that over 90%... Over 90% of the people are riding for free. Why I got so upset with that is because of this. The reason I got so upset at that is because the excuse for us not to get a subway, the excuse for us not, the, the excuse. Okay, the excuse, yeah, yes, okay. We're gonna excuse, say. The excuse, I'm gonna say it anyway because they're just gonna drown me out. The excuse that, that we got for not getting the subway is because we didn't get the count of ridership. The reason we're not getting a subway at, in, in the Jane and Finch corridor along Finch Avenue is because we don't have the ridership. How can we have the ridership and qualify for the subway if we're letting people ride for free? Okay, we're thank not you. Counting thank them. you, Mr. Mamaliti. And that's thank the you. reason I brought we're that issue We're going to take 30 out. seconds responses now. Thank you. Uh, do you want to start? Uh, De uh, Deanna, 30 seconds, please. Um, you know, two seconds. elements to that. I, I think we talk about planning. Uh, we can see issues with planning by both councillors at many levels. We need more forethought for sure. In terms of TTC ridership, I think that's completely unacceptable. And I question the councillor as to when was the last time he rode a bus. I certainly have never gotten on without paying my fare. Okay. Mr. LaRose. Mr. LaRose. I'm, I'm really glad that this question of the TTC came up, but I want to say this. Whether you pay to ride on the TCC or not, it, it, for me it's beside the point. The, it's there to serve us. We need good, respectable transit in the Jane Finch. We need the Jane Finch to be serviced with people that are not rude and discourteous 
and that treat people in this area very badly. I'm talking about the drivers and some of them. They're very unmannerly. They treat people like dirt, and I'm going to make sure that that doesn't continue. I don't care whether you pay or not. It's beside the point. We find a way to keep the TCC going. What's important is treat us with respect that is due, and the TTC need to be, uh, they've got to discipline these people, right? And I'm going to hold all the councils that they are responsible for the kind of conduct that goes on there right now, uh, with security guards tying people up on this, and on, in the, in the uh, subway areas and putting them on the ground. And I mean, it's in handcuffs, it's just ridiculous. Can't continue. Thank you. Amanda? There definitely needs to be better planning in regards to the transit. And I also want to see those stats. Um, Where did you get that percentage from? 90% of people do not pay. I'd like to see those stats. And also, I agree with you, Mr. LaRose. We need, I'd like to see the hiring um, practice for the TTC drivers. And I do agree that we need more respectable um, TTC drivers who are going to treat the riders with dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peruzza. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, there are 47,000 TTC, T, fair paying TTC riders on the 36 bus every day. 47,000. The TTC knows that. And it also knows that, uh, that that's why during the peak hours, whether it's a single bus or it's an articulated bus, it's crowded. It's overcrowded. That's why we need to take transit on Finch Avenue to the next level, so that it's more comfortable, more accommodating, better frequency, so that buses don't get stuck in traffic behind cars that are meandering in and out. Buses that bunch up doesn't work for anybody. Doesn't work for drivers, doesn't work for trucks, doesn't work for transit. That's why we need to make it better for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Peruzza. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I do want to, uh, I'm so sorry. We are going to finish up now. Uh, we'll take one more question from the audience. Faith, I believe it is. Faith, we don't have the time. I really apologize for that. And we do have a Faith Reeves. Yeah, hi, good evening. Thank you so much for organizing this uh, debate and it's been, you know, just wonderful just hearing, you know, the thoughts from the, the candidates and the incumbents you. and you, the audience, are highly motivated. One of the things, I am actually a returning resident. I've lived in Canada for over 40 years. My last 10 years was in <coughs> Alberta. I'm going to tell you something. We had free transportation in certain parts of the city. Not only that, we had inspectors on the bus, so if you didn't pay your fare, they go and they'll check for a transfer or so. So we can do a, a whole lot better here. This is my city, this is where I was grown in, and I love it. I come back and I'm truly disappointed. I look at the Jane and Finch corridors. I, I lived here when I was much smaller. The crime has increased tremendously. And I feel as, um, as members of uh, city council, we could do a whole lot better for our communities. How do we do that? We get out and know the people in the communities. We ensure that they become our friends. The ward now has reduced to 25. How are you gonna manage that? So I'm gonna help you. In Calgary, we had um, community, um, community walkers. So these are various communities. For example, you've got the Driftwood community, help me out people, you've got uh, Chalk Farm community. You're gonna have people in those communities gonna help you manage the communities. You can't do it by yourself, but if you, if you alienate yourself, it's gonna be a problem. Mr. Mamaliti, I was checking your records. Can you, and can you give us a direct for question sure. now, please? For sure. You've missed so many meetings at City oh. Hall. I'm wondering how are you going to sit in town hall meetings to address the issues that the residents has? How are you going to do that when you miss so many important meetings at City Hall and you've got a population that's going to be, say, uh, I think, over 100 and oh, 110,000 people. Correct. So, uh, 
Is that the question related yes. to? Yes. Okay. You're absolutely. So I'm gates. actually glad you asked that question because there's a lot of people that are trying to make heyday of something that really doesn't exist. 90% of the meetings I, and, and votes I am there for. What you're, what you're hearing is recorded votes. Now how the recorded votes work is, is as such. Most of the recorded votes that are taken in council are taken after the council meeting if we drag on. Council is from 9.30 until 8 o'clock typically and I'm there 90% of the time. What happens is with the recorded votes they're typically taken at the end of council and if we finish at 10 or 11 o'clock that's when you hear the, the recorded votes on <coughs> trees and curbs and, and, and those, those, some of those pet projects that people have that they, needed, they need to be counted on, okay? Uh, and so when, when they report on these recorded votes, they're typically between the hours of 8 to 10 o'clock, 11 okay. o'clock at night. All right. I have community meetings regularly in my area, and I, ha I have to ask myself the question all the time, do I want to go to a residential meeting where people want to talk to me and see me in my community, or do I want to vote on Councillor Layton's tree? At the end of the day, it's my community that comes first. It will always come first. Thank you. Now, some are trying to make heyday of the statistics. Mr. Mamalee. And the other part to this equation is, I can... almost died, ma'am. Uh, I, uh, I almost died. I was, in my, I was in my we're deathbed when many of those votes were taken. I was, I was, cr I was critical in, in, for two years. I almost Mr. passed Mamalee, away. The they took has some of those answered. statistics and are currently playing with that. Your question has been answered, sir. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to allow the councillors to give their closing remarks now. Before I do that, I just want to take the time out to say to you, uh, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for your interest in this beautiful historical community of Humber River Black Creek. Thank you for showing up at a private sector debate. This debate was put on as a result of small and medium-sized businesses coming together and uh, funding this, uh, this conversation. And we as small business owners want to continue to do uh, events or debates such as this holding our um, elected officials accountable. I do want to make a statement on behalf of GBKM based on the fact that we are called the mouthpiece of the community. Very grassroots radio station that gets ourselves involved in any issue that pertains to the Humber River Black Creek. We have the lowest voter turnout of all the wards. We have the last uh, recorded statistics show us at 42%. And we also have another problem, uh, our candidates. We have the least amount of voting uh, locations for an area of this size that carries as many people. Uh, and this is what we believe is one of the reasons why our voter turnout is so low. If we have so many of our residents living in apartment buildings, would it not be more uh, realistic or logistically uh, a, a better to set up polling stations within apartment buildings, allowing for the residents to be able to cast their vote in their lobbies rather than finding these obscure polling stations, therefore we can drive a better and bigger turnout. That's an observation based on GBKM. It doesn't require your response. I do want to thank um, all of our uh, um, volunteers this evening and radio hosts uh, for showing up and helping out. We want to just give them your, uh, you know, respect by acknowledging them, please. Want to acknowledge Medea with GBKM FM for going out. Uh, we want to acknowledge Sir Worthy as well uh, for participating, Sir Worthy. We want to acknowledge um, Manzungu who is taking care of the front lobby for you and the refreshments. Um, we want to acknowledge uh, Pastor George as well for assisting me <laughs> in 
the flurry of questions that are online and such. And we want to acknowledge um, our president uh, for GBKM FM, President Seal, Mr. Kenny Baz. Uh, if you can just come and uh, recognize him uh, for the moment. And uh, I thank you also for giving me uh, the opportunity uh, to be your uh, moderator <coughs> this evening as well. I'll just take a second. First of all, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you that made it here today. I want you to understand that this is us. There's nobody that's going to do it for us. This is us. You and I have to hold them accountable. We have to hold them accountable. We need more of this. This cannot happen without the Vice President, Ms. Jacqueline. Thank you very much. Without all the volunteers. This cannot happen without all the sponsors. What seven, we are here to stay. GBKFM is the mouthpiece. Once again, thank you, thank you, and we love you. Um, and my last statement for this evening Before is... Oh, I'm so sorry. And our cameraman, Destin, Destiny, ladies and gentlemen, we want to recognize Destiny. Uh, my last statement, again, for this evening, as we leave and we go our separate ways, is that the Humber River Black Creek is a beautiful melting pot of various different nationalities and cultures. It is literally, um, the, it was the, it's the hub of the immigrant community, and it's been the hub for many, many years. I like to refer to my father, uh, statement when he arrived in Canada in the 1960s. He's been a homeowner in this corridor for some 40 years now. And he said, I arrived here on a Tuesday. I started work on a Wednesday, and I've never taken anything from this government. He loves the Humber River Black Creek. He could have left multiple times. He will not leave. He's a proud homeowner. And I want us to support him and the other proud homeowners as well in this beautiful community. Um, we're going to have closing remarks now, and we will also tell you that there is a flurry of online um, questions. Uh, we ask you to, to you know, like, tag, do whatever you can do, check out the um, social media uh, conversations that are going on, share. Uh, the GBKM YouTube channel will leave this um, uh, debate up for, for until the election and probably after, so you can tell your uh, listeners, viewers, supporters to go and watch the debate all over again <laughs> in the comfort of their homes. So, uh, Deanna, would you be so kind as to give us your closing remarks? Do we have a time limit? Could be 30 seconds. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you to the radio station for being the voice of our community. On October 22nd, you have a choice. The most important thing you can do is exercise your democratic right. Show your respect for our country and the privilege that we have to vote. The second most important thing you need to do is recognize you have a new ward. You have a new area. It's a large area, and it deserves a lot of attention. For far too long, we have seen our taxes go up and up, but our services in this particular community go down and down. When you see the community centers south of the 401, and then you travel north of the 401 from Islington, from Steeles, all the way to Keele and Steeles, you see a significant difference. We have been neglected as a community in the city of Toronto, and it is time for change. When you cast your vote, you have one chance, one chance to bring good representation at the city level to Humber River Black Creek. And I assure you, when you cast that vote for Deanna Scro, you will have an advocate that connects with each and every one of you, regardless of diversity, regardless of background. I am a voice for all of us. I will use my education, my skill set, and my work ethic to represent each and every one of you. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would I... Mr. Mamalidi, are you prepared now to give yeah. your closing I'm remarks? Al I'm always prepared. Okay. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm always prepared because I have a plan, and I'm the only one with a plan. 
Up here, you haven't seen anybody talk about their particular plan. All they've done is criticize mine. All they've done is throw the blows and try and hit me on the chin and try and, and, and embarrass me and try to do the things that, that other candidates do to the leading contender. And at the end of the day, I will take it. Because what I know is that my plan is right. It is about revitalizing a pocket in this community that needs revitalization. 60 years of segregation doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for you. You can criticize me all you like, but I'm the only one with the plan. Others will try and take credit for other things, like Councillor Peruzza taking credit of, of, for the subway up at York University. Really, it was Councillor Preddy that did it. Uh, Ms. Skrull continues to bash me regularly with respect to accountability, but yet the Skrull families had uh, ample time to give us funds for things like housing, through the mother, of course, and that, that, that never comes. It, uh, the Liberals never give us the funding required to deal with the things that we've talked about today. So you continue giving me the blows. You've got access to your mother in the living room. Ask her for more funds with respect to housing and TTC and all the other issues that the federal government is refusing to, to give us. Those will be and very secondly, good conversations. And secondly, my plan includes not only the revitalization, but yes, do exactly what we did at Regent Park and Lawrence Heights, revitalize with a mix, tear down the, the stigmatized social housing that we have of poverty, and bring it up with a mix so everybody's living together and segregation stops. That's my plan. The second part of this equation is the subway and not the train on top of the road. We have a chance to stop this stupidity of an LRT that is going to bog down the traffic on Finch Avenue. We have got the largest tractor trailers in this country using Finch Avenue. And we're about, some of us here, not me, but, but others up here are advocating for this train in the middle of the road. I want to stop it and I've got the ear of the Premier. And I think all of you know that. And if, if I stop it, if I stop it, if I stop it, the subway becomes a reality. We get ourselves designated. And all of a sudden, we've got private investors wanting to buy up Finch Avenue because they know that's the, that's the plan. And at the okay. end of the day, family values are the most important part of this equation. I plan on working with every single faith institution in this, this community and try to bring back a, a little bit of civility when it comes to bringing up our children. Our children are being brought up on the streets of Jane and Finch and nobody's saying anything except me. It's time that we realize that parenting has a lot to do with, with uh, electing a, a counselor and, and making this an issue. I have made it an issue. They're criticizing, for me, uh, criticizing me for it. They don't have a plan. None of them have come to you with a plan. I've got it in writing. Their flyers, all they do is criticize me, all of it. At the end of the day, I'm going to be elected on October the 22nd, and I look forward to working with every one of you whether or not you've been turned off by what I'm, what I'm saying or not. Sledgehammer, name, name, the names I'm using, all of it. It's because I'm trying to protect everybody in this community. That sledgehammer was to thank do you. away with thank segregation. You, Mr. And how dare some of you Th want to you. keep yourselves segregated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mr. LaRose, your closing arguments, please. Well, you know, for me, this has been a very dynamic and inspiring night. I want to thank my colleagues here at the table. I'll call them all that. Uh, because they've all got their particular interests, and they're all working hard to do the best they can. Not good enough, though, but they're trying hard. I want to say this to you. Mr. Mamadidi said I don't have a plan, but... He, has a, he hasn't seen my plan. I've been showing it to the community. There are several pieces in here that talks about the redevelopment of the Jane Finch, revitalization, and re-signifying Jane Finch in its true identity, which is Jane Finch at the center, intersection, Jane and Finch. Development starting there and moving out from there in concentric circles, high density, high residential, commercial, retail offices. I want to ensure that this community that is changing dramatically becomes your community to own and to manage. Not after you've got it all done with the subways running here, multiple high rises like at the corner of Vaughan and Finch, uh, at Finch in Vaughan city center. And then you suddenly find out that you're no longer here. You're gone somewhere else. You better be careful of that. 
If you want to be properly represented in that city council, that does not allow enough room for your voices to be expressed fully because of the reduction in the size of council, then you better be sure you have someone that can defend those fundamental principles. The reason why I came here to Jane Finch was for precisely that. Traveling every day from Burlington, four hours, two hours going, two hours coming. Don't miss a day. I come here six days a week, 72 hours, and I come here without pay. I don't get a wage. I've dedicated every moment here coming for the people of Jane Finch to do exactly what I'm promising. And the only reason I'm running in this race is because the guys and the girls that were actually there before have left this big hole in the wall for me to walk through. I intend to sit on that seat in city council and to make the lives of you better respected, better fulfilled, and better developed. And I want to say to you, on October 22nd, you really don't have to think too hard about the choice. I'm really speaking to the audience outside of here as well, because I know there's an audience. I know Jane Finch actually isn't in this room in the, in the numbers they should be, but you're out there and I'm speaking to you. You make sure you vote for me. Thank you, GBKFM. You guys have done, a, and you have done an excellent job at moderating tonight. I must tell you that, Jack, then, right? right? And I want to respect this audience. This audience, no matter how uh, dynamic and vibrant you were, I know you were feeling strongly about the issues that are at your heart. And I want to tell you that no matter who you elect, I think I could be your best choice. So think carefully before you vote. Don't vote emotionally. Thank you. <laughs> Amanda. All right. Um, on October 22nd, I'm asking everyone to really consider your vote. I'm asking you guys to vote for somebody who shares many of the same lived experiences as many of you. I'm asking you to vote for somebody who knows what it's like to come home and not be able to afford to pay your rent, that knows what it's like to be in a community that might possibly be get, get torn down and you might not have a place to live within the next couple of months, somebody that knows what it's like to be in a vicious pay loan, payday loan cycle like many of the people that I've spoken to while I'm canvassing, somebody that knows what it's like not to find employment in the community that leads to career options. I'm asking you to vote for somebody that actually volunteers her time I've done everything for this community and I've tried to address the needs and the concerns of the residents. I've done this primarily volunteering. I never got paid either to do any of this. From the time I was elected, even before I was elected, and I'll continue to do this at City Hall. I'm not gonna be at City Hall fighting for you, but I'm fighting for myself as well. I'm fighting for a better community for my son. I'm fighting for a better community for every single one of us that live in here. So I'm asking October 22nd to really take the time to think about who you're gonna elect to return to City Hall. This is not a paycheck for me. I'm not out here knocking doors because I want to continue to put money in my pockets. I really care about the issues that are affecting the community and I want to overall better Ward 7 for myself, for my neighbors, for the families that live here, and for everybody else who feels that their voice has not been heard. I've been told that I shouldn't be running as a single mother who lives in community housing. Perus, I was told by that by one of your staff, actually, that I shouldn't be, um, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be running as a single mother in Toronto community housing, and that I have no right to be in this election because I live in Toronto community housing. And I'm here to defeat that status quo, to defy the odds, and to tell anybody and everybody that you can do. You can do anything that you put your minds to and anything that you believe that you can do. Don't let anybody put any limitations on your dreams. Don't let anybody put boundaries on you. And that's why I'm running. I'm running to continue to be an effective voice for the people. I want to I wanna make sure October 22nd, somebody gets elected that truly cares, that truly cares about the people who reside in this community. So October 22nd, please vote Amanda Coombs. You can see all the work that I've done on the in the community at Amanda Coombs. TO on Instagram and Facebook and on Twitter. Thank you again and remember October 22nd, vote Amanda Coombs. The floor is here. Uh, thank you so much. I, um, I started off, we started off the evening by um, 
introducing ourselves, and I, and I told you in that introduction that when, we first when I first immigrated to Canada, I, lived, uh, I went to live on a street called St. Lucie, not too far from here, on Western Road, just south of Finch Avenue. I just want to say that I still, along with Amanda, and, and I appreciate Amanda's can candidacy in this election because it just makes the election better. And I still, and I still, along with Amanda, live in Humber River, Black Creek. Let me say that again. I still, I've never moved out. I still, with Amanda, of all the, of the people here, the uh, uh, of the people uh, living here, uh, uh, of the people up here, I still, I still live in Humber River, Black Creek. I live here with my wife, and that's where I'm raising my two children. Say it again, Anthony. We didn't hear you. I, I have a stake here. I've always had a stake here. I mentioned earlier tonight, and I'm glad that it was reinforced by one of the questioners, that the only way we're going to be able to continue to lift our neighborhood, our neighborhood up, and we are lifting it up, the only way we're going to be able to do that is neighborhood by neighborhood, involving more and more and more people, involving more community groups in, in neighborhood decisions. You can't do what's happening at Weston and Finch. You can't bring in that many units. That thousands and thousands and thousands of new people without the services. You can't bring in that kind of development without community consultation, without the, the community being part of the conversation, being at the table. You can't just simply be out there working for the developers. You gotta work for the community. You gotta roll up your sleeves and wait, work for those neighborhoods. You gotta involve the neighborhoods. So on October 22nd, if you want to continue to work to lift this community up, to lift this ward up, to lift your neighborhoods up, then vote Anthony Peruzza and work with me. Get to work with me on doing that. I'm not going to be chasing headlines. You're not going to find me on television wanting to be famous. But what you are going to find me is in your neighborhood doing the work that needs to be done with you to make it better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and that concludes this year's Ward 8, Ward 7 debate. We want to thank our media partners, Afro Global, and uh, some other outlets as well are here. Uh, thank you so much for showing up today. Take care, and we'll see you at the next debate. <laughs>